So you, can you see the PowerPoint presentation that's being displayed? Yes, we can. All right, great. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jerry Muir, as uh, Steve mentioned, and this is our first session for uh, VITA. And I think we have some new individuals who are attending. So when you do see the acronym VITA, that stands for the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. The program's been around for over 50 years. It is uh, subsidized by the U.S. taxpayers. It's a nationwide program. Actually, it's an international program. There are VITA sites overseas, mostly with military installations. All right, so let's see here. Let's look at our objectives today. Uh, we're gonna do some welcomes and introductions very briefly. We're gonna talk about what's new for the tax year 2020. And a lot of that is based on the CARES Act that passed back in uh, March of 2020. Uh, if, uh, if you've looked at that legislation, I think it's well over a thousand pages, but today we're just gonna look at uh, a few of the tax provisions of that uh, legislation. We're going to talk about uh, managing a site, uh, ethics, screening, and interviewing. That's a big part of what VITA does. We'll have an introduction, introduction to Link and Learn. When you hear the term Link and Learn, uh, that is a site that you can go to that the IRS provides where you can actually uh, uh, look up reference material and you can take your certification. And when you hear the term certification and test, that's the same thing. Uh, program, everybody has to certify whether you are an IRS employee, uh, CPA, an attorney, or just someone who's joined the program for the first year. Everybody will be certified in the Link Learn program. And then of course, we do use what is called TaxSlayer Pro. I think about 99.9% .9 of the sites in the US use that. I know uh, there are a few sites that use other software, but we're gonna use Tax TaxSlayer Pro. And uh, I don't endorse any particular type of tax uh, software. I've used a number of my practice, but uh, TaxSlayer Pro is user-friendly and that's what we're given. And then we'll talk a little bit about filing basics and filing status. We'll touch upon the Affordable Care Act and we'll talk about income, some miscellaneous topics. And then we will do a basic exercise. And then as the weeks go on, they'll become more and more uh, involved or complex. Our session is going to go to noon and then we'll take breaks about every 50 minutes. We'll have two of them, give you an opportunity to recharge your coffee and things like that. Okay, for the St. Killian's team, uh, you did hear Fred Ramos and those other players. You've got Steve, our IT guy. You've got Mel and Art. Uh, John, I didn't see him this morning, but he may be on the call. I can't get it. What's that? Okay. And so those are some of the key players. Um, I would recommend if you need to contact someone, I know Fred's uh, managing the email list. And again, Steve is our uh, IT guy. Uh, a little bit about me. Hello, uh, Trish. A little bit about me. I did work for the IRS. I retired. I also retired awesome. from we the, are so in the Army. I and then currently I have practice on the rural region. So I, I use need to get off, but are you excited or what? <laughs> I think someone needs to go on mute. Natalie Ponka needs to mute. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the publication. Good. Most of you probably have seen some or all of these publications before, but let's go and go down the uh, laundry Super. Okay, Trisha. to these publications. Good. The publication okay, 4012, the that's the volunteer resource guide. And that is the basic document. That's the go-to document when you're at the VITA site. Um, I teach a tax class at a college and I even use that as a reference document. Uh, it, is, uh, it is updated every year. And uh, the IRS spends a lot of time and a lot of money updating that publication. Now, if you say it's a perfect publication, I would say it's, it's close to perfect, but it's not perfect. Sometimes there's a couple of issues and they'll, they'll go ahead and correct those, but it's a great publication. Again, everybody should have that. It's available, I picked mine up at the St. Killian's Church yesterday, and it is available free electronically on the IRS website. It takes you about five seconds to download it. And let's see if I, you know, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna see if I can uh, do another share here. Let's see if I can show you that publication. And it might be a bridge too far at this point. Bridge too far. Okay, here we go. Let's go back to this. All right. The uh, but what I can do, I can I can I can hold it up because I'm in my uh, I'm in my office here. So can you see that? Jerry, sorry to interrupt you, but I uh -huh. do have a link here for the PDF online, and I can go ahead and put that in the uh, chat if you'd like. Uh, please do. Please do. Sorry. So this is the 4012, again, it's updated every year. And we'll, we'll be using that 4012, so if you have a hard copy, great. If you have an uh, electronic uh, copy, we'll, we'll be using that throughout the presentation. 
Okay, the next document is the 6744, and this is the important thing, especially if you are new to the program. The 6744, as it says right there, it's the volunteer assisters test or retest. So this is what I do. You're, you're going to do what you're going to do. This is what I do. When I certify, I will go ahead and read the material. I will go to the 6744. I will answer all the questions, which includes preparing tax returns and then taking certain numbers off the tax return and answering those questions. And then I open up Link and Learn, my certification, my test, and then I plug in the answers and then I hit submit and hopefully I pass my, my test. That's one way to do it. I think that I've been doing that for years and it works for me. The next publication, which is available only electronically this year is the publication 17. And that's updated every year. Uh, I, we, I was on a call the other day with the IRS and someone asked, when is the publication 17 going to be available for the current tax year? And the answer from our representatives were, I don't know. And so that means it probably would come out in another month or two. But again, great publication available electronically for free. Um, I do know that, uh, now nah, I'd, I'd be nah, asking last year. Okay, next, instructions to the Form 1040. We spend a lot of time with the software, and what that means is a lot of people, they because you're using the software, they don't get into the instructions. I highly recommend you take a look at the instructions to the Form 1040. It's updated every year. It has new information, and it will definitely educate you. It, when, I, when I read them every year, I, I, get, I get educated on new things. In fact, there's a couple things we'll talk about today that I got directly out of the instructions to the Form 1040. And then when we talk about the VITA program, everybody, whether you are a greeter, a site coordinator, a quality reviewer, or an electronic return originator, everybody's going to take what is called the ethics test or the volunteer standards of conduct. It's a short test, takes you about five or 10 minutes, but you want material to review before you take that test. And uh, that publication is the 4961. And then next we have what is called the intake and interview and quality review training. Uh, part of VITA is every taxpayer is going to complete an intake and interview sheet. And then what happens is a screener or a tax preparer is going to take a look at it and then ask some follow-up questions. And so most of us, if, if you're over age 30 or 40, you, you probably conducted a, a couple hundred interviews in your life. But again, that publication 5101 will prepare you uh, to take that intake and interview and quality review uh, test because that test, that certification, is the next certification. It takes about 10 minutes. And then uh, if you're new to the program, you probably want to make a mental or a written note. Uh, the form 13615, that's a volunteer standards of conduct. And that document is going to be electronically generated in the, uh, in the Lincoln Learn program. And then what you will do, you will provide that document, either a hard copy or electronic version uh, to your site coordinator. And then that way, the site coordinator has a record of who has certified and at what level. And then the publication 525, one of my favorite publications, because every time I go to the VITA site, I always get a question, Jerry, is this taxable or non-taxable? And I'll look at the information, I'll say, I don't know. And, uh, and then I'll go into that 525 and I'll typically find the answer. I think it's a pretty good pub. And then in the VITA program, we do have a lot of self-employed individuals making 20 or $30,000 a year and they're brand new to a business or maybe they have been conducting their business for a while and they're not quite sure about uh, income, reporting income, reporting deductions, things like that. The publication 334, which is updated every year, does a great job for individuals, again, who have a small business. Uh, maybe you're a tutor, a daycare provider, something like that. Uh, the pub 334, again, does a, does a great job. And the next, I know uh, a lot of people are in the VITA program uh, I think most people in the VITA program, at least the ones I meet, they want to do it because it's a great program. It helps folks out. And uh, if you're a tax professional, you can also earn what are called continuing education credits. And uh, examples of tax professionals would include a certified public accountant and an enrolled agent, or perhaps maybe a member of the California Tax Education Council. Those are some examples. And so you could earn those credits. And of course, your site coordinator has to verify that you have certified at a certain level and maybe you volunteer at the site. And that publication, again, does a great job explaining continuing education credits. Like for me, for example, uh, I'm an enrolled agent, which means uh, over a certain period of time, I have to have continuing education credits. If I do not, then I lose my enrolled agent status and I have to start all over again. 
And the next, uh, we, uh, if you're, hopefully all of you are in California, if you're not in California in the VITA program, uh, I, I work at Coastline Community College and uh, we only prepare federal returns and California state returns. I believe that's the same for St. Killian's, correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong. So what that means is you want to be familiar with the Franchise Tax Board instructions to that uh, Form 540. That's the basic tax return for California. And then this year on January 1st, 2020, uh, legislation came into being where if you're living in California, you're working in California, you're filing that California tax return, you have to have health coverage. And if you don't, then you're going to pay what is called an individual share responsibility payment, which is a penalty. Or if, if you can get an exemption, then you don't have to pay that. But that's new this year for the state of California, not for the federal government, but for the state of California. And we'll talk about that. I did an example on one of the website uh, the other day. I'll show you an example of how that works. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a little bit and see if anybody has a question regarding these publications or they wanna make a comment. Yeah, Jerry, Arnie Herrera. Hi, Arnie. Hi, I had just send you a, a message on, on, on chat, but I think it's best if uh, uh, my question was whether it would be possible to uh, for you to send a list of these publications so that we will know where to go to find uh, you know, a particular piece of information. Sure, well, what I can do, I'll confer with Steve, the IT guy, and we'll get this, uh, this PowerPoint publication out to uh, all of the folks who participated. Will that work? That would work for me, thank you. Okay, all right, great. All right, so again, that's the laundry list. Now, this is not a, a comprehensive list in the VITA program, but uh, if you're familiar with these publications, these forms and these instructions, uh, you're going to do uh, probably quite well in your certifications and uh, at the VITA site. And then at the VITA site, the IRS requires a number of things to include the publication 4012, whether it be in a hard copy or electronic format, most people have a hard copy, and then that publication 17, which would be in an electronic uh, format. Okay, hold on a second, my, uh, my screen has frozen. We can see it, Jerry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still manipulating the document. There we go. Okay. Okay. I think we're, as they say in Hollywood, I think we're back. Okay, so a few things that are new this year, and uh, this might be a great thing for some, and other people might say, mm, maybe not so much. There's what is called the Qualified Experience Volunteer Test. This is yet another test that the IRS has added to the uh, Link and Learn or the certification process. So here's the good thing about the Qualified Experience Volunteer Test. Uh, you can take it, it's 20 questions, and if you pass that test, then you are considered certified at the advanced level. So that's a good thing. The not so good thing is if you are a tax professional and you want continuing education credits, you're not gonna earn them with a qualified experience volunteer test. You've gotta take another test. But again, that's new this year and uh, that might uh, save some time for those folks who uh, just wanna get certified but they're not interested in CE credits. And then uh, also new this year is the health savings account. Uh, that's been a separate certification over the years. Uh, short test usually takes about uh, 20 or 30 minutes. It is now incorporated in the advanced certification. And so uh, in about a week or so, week and a half, uh, when you open up the 2020 tax year, you're not gonna see health savings account. Again, that's been incorporated uh, in uh, the advanced certification. So let's look at some of the Corona aid, relief, and uh, economic security provisions. That's the so-called CARES Act. And if you go into your publication 4012, you'll see the, uh, the CARES Act uh, tax provisions sprinkled in certain portions of the publication 4012. So let's talk about some of the big things that you're probably gonna bump into at the VITA site. If you're familiar with taking a distribution from a, a qualified retirement plan, like a 401k or an IRA, something like that, 
Um, if you're, here's the general rule, and you, you'll hear this not only at the FIDA site, you'll hear this in tax class, you'll hear your, uh, your more experienced preparers talk about this. There's, there's usually general rules and there's exceptions to the general rule. So like the way I like to put it is, in the state of California, the general rule is to become an attorney and to represent clients, you have to graduate from college and then you have to graduate from law school and then you have to take the bar examination. That's the general rule. Well, in the state of California, there's an exception. You don't have to graduate from college and you don't have to graduate from law school. You have to meet some other provisions. And if you meet those provisions and take the bar examination, then you can become a licensed attorney in California. So that's, that's an exception. So there's many exceptions. So going back to the 10% rule, if you're, uh, the general rule is if you're under 59 and a half and you take the withdrawal, then you have to pay a 10% penalty to the federal government and to the state of California, the software is going to calculate a two and a half percent penalty. Well, the good news is with the CARES Act, if you take a distribution and you're taking that money for certain reasons, you're not going to pay that 10% penalty. And so that's a good thing for folks who are taking that money out and using it for certain, uh, certain reasons. And then here's another good thing about the CARES Act. Uh, that distribution that you take out, of course, uh, you still have to pay income tax on it. You can spread it out over three years. So I think that's a good thing. But then here's, for our purposes, it's out of scope. And when you hear the term out of scope, there's a lot of things that we don't do in the VITA program uh, because this is a basic tax program. And so if you have someone says, I've taken a distribution, okay, great, you're not going to be paying that 10% penalty. Well, I want to spread that uh, income over three years. Okay, great, you can do that, but we can't help you out because it's out of scope. And if you have your publication 4012 available, if you go to the front part of the document, you'll see a number of things that are in scope, which means we can help you out with if you have that proper certification and things that are out of scope. And then the required minimum distribution, what that means is when you reach a certain age and you have a qualified plan, you have to take a certain amount out. Well, those are suspended under the CARES Act, which is good for some of our senior citizens. And then something, um, and it's not a big deduction, but nonetheless, it is a deduction. Uh, if you make a contribution to a qualified charitable organization and you do not itemize, which means you have a Schedule A, you can take what is called an above the line deduction. And if you go to your form 1040 for 2020, there's, there's a draft document on the IRS website, you can see that uh, that's online 10B, B is in Bravo. And so that's a good thing for people who make uh, contributions and they do not itemize. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask someone to, uh, to answer a question. Boy, you got 53 people. Okay, how about Adela? Adela, could you come off mute? I'm gonna ask you a softball question. Oh, I'm not ready for this, but okay. Adela, did you receive the economic impact payment uh, this year? Did you get a, a check from the government? We did, yes. All right, great. And a lot of people did, a lot of people did. The higher income folks did not. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's the way it is. And so those, uh, those payments are non-taxable and you're probably gonna get that question at the VITA site, non-taxable. And another thing that uh, we will most likely see when that software comes about, meaning the, uh, the new software is posted on the, uh, the practice lab, the IRS website, is what is called self-employment tax deferral. And what that means is if you're a self-employed individual and you have net income of $400 or more, then you're responsible for paying what is called self-employment tax. It's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's like FICA, the Federal Insurance Contribution Act, except it's under SECA, which is the Self-Employment Contributions Act. And so again, you're gonna meet a lot of self-employed individuals and they're gonna have net income. Net income means profit, if you will. And so they have an option. Um, they have to pay that social security tax. And what they can do is they can spread that social security tax over a couple of years. Are we supposed to ask questions? Or? Uh, in my opinion, I think a lot of people probably don't want to take advantage of this because what that means is the tax is going to be due at the end of 2021, at the end of 2022. But this is an option. People have options. If you can explain the option, option A, option B, then the taxpayer then will uh, make that decision. So I think that's I think that's good for some folks. Are we supposed to ask questions or is this? Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to pause at the end of this slide and then I'll, I'll entertain questions. Thank you. And uh, another provision is if you have an employer who's paying student loans, which uh, you might see that from time to time, uh, what happens is um, that's going to be non-taxable to, uh, to the individual, i.e. the employee. So that's a good thing. 
And then uh, the, the health savings account, uh, it now if you're taking money out of that HSA to uh, uh, pay for what are called over-the-counter medications, meaning not prescribed by a medical professional or some feminine need products, um, that can also be paid out of the HSA. So here are some examples of things that you might bump into uh, for the CARES Act at the, uh, at the VITA site. Okay, so with that, I'll pause and I'll entertain questions and see if I can answer any of those. Question, this is Scott. Uh, isn't the economic impact payment you said is non-taxable, isn't it a non isn't it a refundable tax credit? No, the economic impact uh, payment is non-taxable. Now, what I will talk about, I'll talk about the recovery rebate uh, later. But no, the economic impact, uh, again, some people got it uh, non-taxable, non-taxable. So it's not a tax credit? Uh, it, uh, I, I thought it was, I thought it was a credit. Tax credit, it is not taxable. And then when you prepare a tax return for 2020, uh, what you have to do uh, when you're trying to calculate that recovery uh, rebate credit, then you have to take into effect the economic impact payment that was received. All right, any other questions about the uh, qualified experience volunteer test or some of the other questions that, or some of the other things that we talked about? Hey, Jerry, this is Mel. Yes, Mel. Um, the uh, regular unemployment is, uh, we all understand that's taxable, but the uh, federal gave another, I think, 300 for a short period of time. So is that safe to assume that it's also non-taxable on the federal level? Unemployment compensation is fully taxable on the federal level. The state of California does not tax it. Right, but the additional 300 stimulus for the unemployed, is that a taxable on the federal it is, side? It is, it is taxable for the federal side because it's under that umbrella of unemployment compensation. Gotcha, thank you. Sure. Okay, okay. any on. other questions before we move on? Yeah, yes, this is, this is Audie. Uh, for the AARP program, the volunteers are required to take the advanced test. They can take the QEV test to um, uh, test their own, to test their skills. It, it looks like a challenging test, but they are required to take the advanced test to certify. Uh, is that a statement or a question, Audie? No, that's a statement. Because you, you said that the VITA people can take the uh, QEV test in lieu of the advanced test. Uh, it doesn't apply to the, to the um, AARP people. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, that's, that's a good point, Legacy. Like people are gonna do what they're gonna do. When, when people come to me and say, Jerry, what should I do? I highly recommend, and this is what I do, I highly recommend they take the basic certification and then move to the advanced certification because I've met CPAs, I've met enrolled agents, I've met retired and current IRS revenue agents who flunked uh, the, uh, the, uh, the advanced test because they didn't have that basic knowledge from the basic test. But, but again, it depends on your site coordinator. Maybe your time is limited, but uh, that's what I do. I take the basic and the advanced. Okay, any other questions before we move on? This is Nilima. Jerry, I have a question. Mm-hmm. And my question is on the chat side, if you want to read it and then respond. Okay, let me go to chat. Let me open it up. And the question is, if you take a distribution from an IRA and spread over three years, do you pay taxes in three years too? And the answer would be yes. If you spread it over three years, that means you're going to pay income tax in year one and then year two and then in year three, because what you're doing effectively, you're reporting income for three years or over a three year period. Okay, thank you. Sure. Jerry got follow up question on the early penalty withdrawal for uh, IRA distribution. Okay. Is there a criteria that they need to satisfy uh, for uh, drawing their 401k, let's say what it's used for, or is that across the board? For this year, uh, it's there, there is there is criteria, and if you get into your publication 4012 or your instructions at the form 1040, basically what you're doing is uh, you're using those monies because uh, someone in the family is sick or you have financial distress. If you take uh, you take your money out and uh, you take a worldwide uh, cruise, that is not going to waive that 10% penalty. Gotcha. 
Thank you. Yeah. And I was having a discussion with another tax professional the other day, and uh, I think and I think the CARES Act has done wonderful things for a lot of people, but it uh, it is also make work for accountants, world agents, bookkeepers, and vital volunteers. This is a uh, there's a lot of changes to the tax law based on that. But again, it's if you read the uh, the legislation, it has done some wonderful things for uh, for a lot of people. Uh, Jerry, a follow up on the same on the same question. Uh, uh, do we take the, uh, the the taxpayers' word for whatever they tell us, or 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 do they have to document what does uh, withdrawals from uh, uh, 401k were used for, for instance? Yeah, yeah. What you're going to do is you're going to conduct that interview, and uh, the tax you're going to rely on the taxpayers' what is called oral testimony. Uh, now, of course, if you're preparing a return. And, and I've seen this a number of times where you feel uncomfortable, i.e. you think the taxpayer is uh, lying to you, uh, then at every VITA site, you can say, hey, site coordinator, I don't feel comfortable preparing this return based on the conversation or the information that's been provided. I've done that myself a lot of times. I'll tell the taxpayer, I'm not gonna call them a liar because that's a very harsh term. I'll just say, I'm not gonna prepare your return because what you're telling me does not make any sense. So you can go to another preparer or you can leave the site and go somewhere else. Uh, and you want to use care bear language, you're, you're not going to uh, make the uh, taxpayer feel offended. But that's your, I think that's your right. If, uh, if I remember from my readings, and, and Annette, if you're still on the call, you can chime in, again, if you don't feel comfortable. But what's really important before you ask the question, you've got that list of items in front of you, and you tell the taxpayer, hey, I'm, I'm trying to determine, is this 10% going to apply to you? Here's the criteria. Let's go, let's go through this. And then you're going to elicit a, elicit a response from the taxpayer. Thank you. Long response to a short question. Okay, let's do this. Um, I'm going to, again, my uh, my computer froze. Steve, you're gonna have to buy me a new computer. Okay, let's talk about a few more things and, and then we'll, uh, and I think we can take a first break then. Okay, you also heard about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. And uh, that's really not going to uh, play a whole lot at your VITA site, but you're gonna have some employers, employees with uh, sick pay. And what that means, it'll be run through the W-2, so you really don't have to do a whole heck of a lot. And we talked about the recovery rebate credit, and we're gonna see in the new software how that uh, comes into play. And what that recovery rebate credit is, is if you did not receive one of the economic impact uh, payments. Like for example, I didn't get one of those. And so what that means is file my tax return, I'm gonna go to line 30 of the form 1040, and I'm gonna see if those rules apply to me and see if I can get uh, a payment, if you will. And uh, for those high income individuals, they're not gonna be eligible for that payment. And we're gonna see again next week or the week after that, how the software handles that. I've yet to see it in the software. Other things, Again, it's, uh, it's right on the tax form. It's built into the software. The standard deduction has increased for uh, single folks, married filing joint, qual uh, qualifying woodwork, and head of household. And again, built into the software. Uh, another thing that uh, the uh, CARES Act brought about is the deductible IRA contribution. And what that means is uh, you, uh, once you reached a certain age under the old tax law, you couldn't contribute to an individual retirement arrangement. And uh, the CARES Act said, well, um, you, you can still contribute if you're, uh, you're over that age. So that's a good thing for, for some of our seniors who are still working and want to uh, build up an IRA. And then another, another new thing, and, and maybe some people are gonna get a little nervous on this, the Schedule LEP, uh, Lima Echo Papa, that's new this year. And all that form is, is if you have a taxpayer who wants to receive written correspondences from the IRS in Spanish, in Italian, in Urdu, uh, in Vietnamese, they can fill out the form. And then if there are any uh, written documents that are gonna be sent to the taxpayer, then it'll be sent in their language. Now the form 1040 itself, obviously it's, it's in English, they're still gonna file that, but they can request that form. And there's, uh, I looked, I think there's about 18 to 20 languages. And then in your publication 4012, it talks about the legislative extenders. What that means is uh, the, uh, the Congress, i.e. the Senate and the House of Representatives, what they do uh, every, 
uh, it used to say every year. What they do on a regular basis is they change tax law. So what they'll do, they'll extend certain laws that were passed, passed by Congress, signed by the president, and then enacted. And some of the things that have been extended for 2020 is a discharge and qualified principal resident, residence indebtedness. And what that means is, um, it, it's, it's in your publication 4012, but what that means is you may be able to, uh, depending on the circumstance, if, uh, if you have discharge of debt, and the general rule is, if you borrow money and you don't pay it back, uh, then you have to report that discharge of indebtedness on your tax return and pay ordinary income tax rates. That's the general rule. There are exceptions to that general rule. And one of them is if you have a house and uh, the house is taken from you because of uh, a foreclosure and you meet certain rules, then that discharge is not gonna be considered taxable income. And uh, we'll talk about that probably in week three in a little bit more. Uh, tuition and fees deduction, uh, I've seen this maybe a couple times uh, when you go to college and you meet certain requirements, you can take either the American Opportunity Credit, which has a refundable and a non-refundable component, or you can take the Lifetime Learning Credit, which is non-refundable, or you can take the tuition and fees deduction. And that tuition and fees deduction, uh, it, uh, it, it was, it's been around for a few years, but again, for 2020, it's available. I think you're not going to have a whole lot of taxpayers take advantage of it because when you consider a uh, refundable or non-refundable credit, that's going to be a bigger bang for the buck. And if you're brand new, when you hear the term non-refundable credit, it's simply a dollar per dollar reduction of the tax. If you hear the term refundable credit, that means you can have a tax liability of zero and still get money back. And so again, you're not going to see a whole lot of people um, utilizing the tuition and fees deduction. And then another extender is the residential energy credits. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I see it from time to time on tax returns, but not a lot. But again, it's, it's a little bit involved and we'll get into the nitty gritty on that in a later session. Okay, so I'll pause for a moment and see if anybody has any comments or questions about this slide. Okay, I have no questions and I have a question. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Evelyn, you, you're, a, you're a returning volunteer. Can you come off mute, El? El, El uh, okay, I'm yes, off mute. Sure. I've got a softball question for you. Have, have you ever prepared a tax return for a VITA taxpayer that have the tuition and fees deduction? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Have you ever prepared a tax return at a VITA site for a taxpayer and they have the tuition and fees deduction? Uh, I, I have. You have? College student. Okay. How many times? One, five, 20? Maybe one or two. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you're not going to see it that often. It's yeah. available though, but you're not going to see it. Okay. And then for those of you who are brand new, or maybe you've just got one season under your belt, we will have a very detailed discussion about the, uh, the American Opportunity Credit for college students and the Lifetime Learning uh, Credit for those individuals who are going to post-secondary education, i.e. college. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, 949, too early for a break. Let's move on. If you're brand new, you probably want to take some notes or you know, mental or written. But let's talk a little bit about uh, ethics, screening, interviewing, and then let's have a little bit of a dialogue because <clears throat> there's a lot of information that uh, people have because of the experience in the VITA program or AERP. <clears throat> okay, the volunteer standards of conduct, that is the ethics test. And that particular uh, test takes you, I think, about 10 minutes. Um, I think uh, I want to say about 10 questions or so. It's pretty quick. But again, anytime you're getting ready for a test or certification, you want reference material. And so that publication 4961, that's your, your material that you can read through. Now, if you have, if you have the uh, publication six, I, I stand corrected, the form 6744, and that is the, the uh, document we talked about where you can actually list all of your, uh, your answers before you take the uh, test in Link and Learn. If you go to your form 6744 and the inside cover, there is a description of the volunteer standards of conduct for the VITA and uh, TCE program. And it talks about a number of things. It talks about not accepting payment, uh, treating people respectfully, 
uh, not engaging in some type of behavior where you're trying to uh, uh, get a refund for a taxpayer where they, they don't uh, they don't deserve a refund, if you will, or trying to deposit monies in your bank account that belong to a taxpayer. That's a huge no-no. Um, but again, those are the rules, the ethics, and you follow the ethics. And I like to look at it as the golden rule. You're, you're, you want to go to the Vita site. You want to do the right thing. But of course, the IRS insists that we all go through this training and then take that to volunteer standards of conduct uh, test, a short test. That's your first test or certification you're going to test or take. I'm going to pause for a moment and see if anybody has any comments about uh, ethics, because we've all bumped into things at the Vita site that uh, may have been borderline or just flat out unethical. Does anybody want to comment? Jerry, can you hear me? Uh, who's that? It's Sean. Sean, so go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. If, uh, a taxpayer does not have documentation for certain things, but they're providing you information in their oral testimony and you help them fill out a summary document. Is that a ethical violation? No, I don't think so. I mean, the yeah. way I do it. Okay, I, I press what, unmute now. What, to, what, what I'll do. And then Sean, what, oh, participate. Yeah, what, what I'll do, Sean, is I'll sit down with the taxpayer and yes, they're gonna provide oral testimony. If I feel comfortable preparing the return, I'm going to do it. I always, tell them, I always tell them, the information that you're providing then us, what? we're going to use this to prepare a tax return. And so what that means is it's on them. And so, like, for example, Say I host mute me. I don't know why. It... Can, can you go on mute, Hughes? Uh, can you go on mute? So what, what I used to tell people is, uh, this is your tax return. I'm going to help you out with it. I used to audit uh, tax returns that were prepared at a Vita site. And they would say, well, the, the volunteer did, did the return. I said, well, yes, they did. But you're the person who signed the return. You're the person who's responsible for the return. Now, that doesn't happen very often. But when you, when you inform a taxpayer that they have to provide information that is correct, uh, they're usually going to play ball. But again, if you feel uncomfortable, you should go to your site coordinator and say, site coordinator, I feel uncomfortable for these reasons and then maybe it's going to be assigned to another uh, volunteer, or maybe the site coordinator will tell the taxpayer, taxpayer, uh, this is not your cup of tea. Uh, we, we're not going to help you out here for these reasons. You want to go somewhere else. But uh, again, you're going to help them out. But short answer to your question is, no, it's not. Thanks. Sure. Okay, screening. Uh, screening is a big thing. Um, and uh, at my site, I try to get the smartest people, the most experienced people in screening, because what happens is the taxpayers usually get past that screen you, and then what happens is they don't have documents or their returns out of scope. So when you talk about screening, your screener wants to know the scope of service. And so if you go into your publication 4012, those first few pages, it has- I think it looked like it's unmute on the picture. It, it showed that uh, the microphone is supposed to be, it is on, there's no red line now. Okay, so uh, so scope of service, it's on those few first pages, 4012, and it's an extensive list of the things that we will help taxpayers out with and the things that we won't. So for example, um, I've been at sites where taxpayers say, hey, I've got a schedule ease and echo, I've got rental property, I have rental income and rental expenses, and I have depreciation. And so unless you're certified, uh, and I'm talking only for VITA right now, Audi, uh, you can jump in if you want, but for VITA, you have to be certified in the military certification, and then the site coordinator says, yes, we'll do, uh, we'll do schedule E's as an echo. But again, uh, scope of service, that's what your screener wants to do. Uh, I typically have two or three screeners, oh. right, and I have them read the scope of service and show the taxpayer, sorry, we can't help you out here because we're simply not trained. My wife puts it the best. Would you want an untrained mechanic putting brakes on your automobile? And the answer is no. And do you want an untrained or an undertrained person trying to do your tax return? The answer is no. And that's why the scope of service comes into play because the VITA program is basic tax preparation. Uh, Audie, can you jump in? What, what, what do people do at the AERP site for, uh, for Schedule E's? Uh, we do not do anything with depreciation. So we, we don't do rentals, we don't do um, home office with depreciation. Um, 
All right, great. And then another thing about screening, um, it says on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, on the slide here, you're reviewing the information returns. Information returns, and we'll talk about that later in detail. Those are the documents like the W-2, the 1099 INT. And like I always tell people, information returns have information and that information may be incorrect. And that's why it's important to conduct that interview, that screening, if you will, with that taxpayer. And then there's a thing I call white noise. Uh, you, you've seen it before. You ask somebody a question, what time it is, and 35 minutes later, uh, they end up describing the, uh, the mechanics of a clock. Uh, so that's the way people are. They're going to give you a short answer or a long answer. And so you're going to get past all that information that is not applicable. And that's why your screeners have to be well-trained and they have to be experienced and they have to be very patient too. And then here's another thing. It says, don't make exceptions. When you start making exceptions, you're going to make people mad, maybe your site coordinator. And then that taxpayer is going to leave the site and tell all of her friends hey, this site, they'll do schedule E's, so come on down, and, and then all of a sudden, you've got a big, bad situation in your hands. So you're going to be polite. You're going to tell the taxpayers uh, that's out of scope. We are not trained to do that. And then you're going to be patient. You're going to use that care bearer language. So the bottom line is you're not going to make exceptions. I've done that before uh, many years ago, and it did not work out well for me. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, I've got 9.57. Why don't we come back at about uh, uh, five minutes after 10 o'clock? So 10.05, we'll come back. Okay, everybody. Um, we have a break, and um, we have to take a break. And see you in a bit. So just stay here on the, don't disconnect, right? Right. Please do not disconnect. So I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, that way um, we will not be um, uh, recording uh, a dead silence there. So um, once we're resumed, then I will uh, restart the recording. Okay. Typically at most sites, uh, your quality reviewers are going to be your individuals. Uh, that have uh, a little bit of experience. Maybe they've worked at the site for a couple of years. And of course, there's a publication. That publication is available on the IRS website. It's also available in the Link and Learn program, which I'm going to show you when we open up, open up the Link and Learn. Uh, we talked about information returns. And uh, what I do, and I think most volunteers do, is they review those information returns. And um, if, if I were to call on a, a former IRS employee or a current IRS employee, and ask them how many information returns there are, the answer would probably be, I don't know. There are many. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. But the main ones that we look at are the W-2s, the 1099 for interest and dividend, maybe a brokerage statement, or maybe an SSA 1099 for Social Security recipients. But you want to take a look at those and make sure you have all of them. Uh, the screener should have done that, but sometimes that, uh, that taxpayer is going to get past that gatekeeper, and then you're going to say, Wait a second, you've got three jobs. Where's the other W-2s for your other jobs? And then conducting that thorough interview, you, you want to be pleasant. Uh, you you want to make sure you get the information from that taxpayer. And that's why you've got to ask them, like I always say, ask them the 20 questions. And usually you're going to get, uh, if they're providing correct information and complete information, you're going to be able to help them out. And I would say the vast majority of taxpayers, uh, they, they're there because they want the return done. They appreciate your efforts, and they're going to give you all the information that you ask for. And then sometimes you're just going to have to tell the taxpayer, we can't help you today. Uh, you don't have the documents that we need. You don't have this. You don't have that. And sometimes you're going to say, can you come back next week? Can you come back tomorrow, whenever the next session is? And, uh, of course, you leave them with, the, with the, the hope that when they come back, you're going to be able to help them out. And then sometimes, and I've, I've done it where I've met with taxpayers, and they say, look, based on this situation, there is no way that I can help you because it's out of scope. And in that case, you're going to say you're going to have to go somewhere else. And they'll ask you, where do I go? And I always like I'm playing tennis. I put it back in their court. And I said, well, in Southern California, there are thousands and thousands of paid professionals. And uh, you probably want to go out and get yourself a paid professional because I can't help you. And again, um, you want to use that care bear language, but there are certain people you simply cannot help. And, if I open up the uh, the microphones right now, I bet you I'd get 20 or 30 different stories. But again, thorough interview, look at the information returns, and ask a whole bunch of questions. 
And, you know, um, I, I think I know a little bit about tax. I'm not an expert, uh, but there's sometimes I just don't know. And so what I'll have to do, I'll have to open up the publication 4012. I'll have to go on the IRS website. Or sometimes I go across the, uh, across the aisle and I talk to someone who I know and say, hey, have you seen this before? It's okay to say, <clears throat> I don't know. Or like I said before, it goes to that publication 525 that talks about taxable and non-taxable income. Okay, taxpayer management, this is really for your site coordinator. Uh, and Fred, are you still on the call? I want to ask you a softball question. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can, Fred. Fred, here's your softball question. Who will be the site coordinator for St. Killian this coming uh, season? <clears throat> Uh, that's a, an open question right now. We have all this core member. We try to rotate as much as we can who's going to be the site coordinator. All of us in the site are all site coordinator qualified. Uh, or at least uh, six of us are site coordinator qualified. So I, 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 anyone else among the six can, mm -hmm. can step in to be the site coordinator. So we'll try as much as we can if we can rotate each and one of us so that we can expand the uh, experience as well as uh, everybody else have that experience anyway when everybody uh, uh, are, are have we have that kind of uh, option uh, it give us a leeway so that if I am gone somebody else can step up okay great great so for the new people out there what happens is that site coordinator they're basically like an operations manager of the site and they're going to take that site coordinator training and most sites will have a, uh, a deputy or an alternate site coordinator. So like Fred say, when the site coordinator is gone, then that alternate site coordinator uh, stands up and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the acting site coordinator. And that's great to have that depth, uh, kind of like a football team. And in some cases, like uh, we operate a site, we've got uh, three or four people like Fred has who are trained. So when someone is gone, then we've got a designated site coordinator. And what they're doing is they're making sure the site is run smoothly, which means they're working with their taxpayers. Uh, they are managing their tax uh, tax preparers, and uh, they're also managing the flow, the, the actual physical flow of taxpayers. And that's really important. And again, uh, St. Killian's, they're, they're going to do it differently from another site. But that site coordinator has a lot of things on their shoulder. So again, if you're brand new, you're you're gonna you're gonna know who that site coordinator is, that alternate site coordinator, and then you're gonna see how they manage, <clears throat> excuse me, how they manage the actual physical flow. Now, of course, this coming season, chances are because of the COVID situation, probably all or a vast majority of sites are gonna be virtual, which means they're not gonna be meeting face to face. And so what that means for the site coordinators, they're gonna have a written plan in place they're going to share with their volunteer tax preparers and uh, and they'll go from there. Kind of like what St. Kellyans did back uh, back in June and July. But again, for the new folks, site coordinator is the operations manager and that's the, uh, the go-to person if you have questions or concerns. Uh, I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions about uh, this screen? Uh, Jerry Arney again. Uh, I noticed that uh, the uh, Lincoln Learn is not showing the, the tax certifications yet for 2020. That's uh, correct. That showed last year. So I, I, I'm going to follow your suggestion and complete it, you know, the one on paper. And then once it's available online, I'll, I'll do them online. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, I, I know in years past, I would sit there and of course I've had the benefit of tax training and I go right to the software <clears throat> and uh, I found that, uh, uh, I like putting things in the book because I can go back and look at it because I typically have questions and so I want to go back. But again, uh, it's one way to do business. Thank okay, you. Let's go ahead and talk about our Tax Slayer Pro. And when you hear the term Tax Slayer Pro and Link and Learn, uh, those are the sites you're going to go to on the IRS. They're free. And uh, this is really important, especially if, you knew, if you're new. If you're new, I would make written notes here. Link and Learn, that's the place you go to certify to take the test, and you are going to create an account before you actually get into Link and Learn, and we're going to show you that screen. And then you want to jot down your, uh, your username and your password, so when you want to go back to that account to take the certifications, uh, you're going to plug in that right to stuff. I can't tell you how many times I've misplaced my password. Of course, you can recover your password, but the bottom line is you've got to create an account for Link and Learn. 
<clears throat> and then toward the bottom of the screen, it talks about the practice lab. Practice labs equals tax slayer software. And for the practice lab, you also have to create an account. And so you want to keep that in mind. So that way you've got uh, two passwords, two usernames, so you can get into Link and Learn to take the certification and to jump into the practice lab. And I think just about everybody on this call, probably 100% of us are going to be using, uh, in the season, we're going to be using the Tax Slayer Pro tax uh, software. Again, I know there's a site or two in Southern California that do not use it. But again, it's available for free from the IRS. So let's talk a little bit about Link and Learn. Uh, and as, uh, as we mentioned, the 2019 modules are currently posted. So if you want to practice, most of you probably have already done it, but the brand new folks, if you want to practice in 2019, you can. But the 2020 module, that is going to be posted on or about the middle of uh, the month. So during these, uh, these Zoom sessions that we are conducting, uh, we'll actually take that uh, pivot, if you will, and we'll jump into the 2020 modules. Uh, we already talked about the volunteer standards of conduct. That's going to be the first certification everybody takes. When you, uh, whether you're new or whether you're uh, returning, if you do not want to be a site coordinator, you have no plans to be a site coordinator, then when it asks, are you going to take this training, you should say no. Your intake and interview and quality review, everybody takes uh, that who's going to be a uh, preparer. Uh, your basic certification, um, let's call on someone. Let's get a someone who's been invited for a while. How about Adela? Adela. Can you come off mute, Adela? Do you hear me? I do. Another softball question for you. Uh, when you hear uh, the term basic uh, certification, uh, what type of items are in the basic certification? Uh, W-2s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe some interest. Okay. It's pretty, uh, well, actually you can get education credits too, but. Uh... Right, so just, just your, your basic tax credit. A lot of folks who come to the VITA site, they are wage earners. They might have some interest, like Adela said. And so that's the basic certification. And again, what you want to do, uh, whether you are a brand new person or returning, if you're going to take that basic, it's good to review the material and we'll show you where to go. Uh, and you also have your publication 4012. And keep in mind, if you're new, when you're taking these certification, it is self-paced and there's no limit. And so sometimes you'll be taking an exam and you decide you want to take lunch. So you walk away from the computer after you save your information, you come back and you start taking the exam again. Um, Adela, since we got you on the phone here, what about the advanced certification? What, uh, what is it all about? Advanced, you'll have self-employment, um, uh, 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 <laughs> um, like, oh gosh, you got me, my brain is frozen. Yeah, like capital gains and losses, so a little bit more. Yeah. Advanced, uh, thank you, though, and it simply means it's just additional topics. They're not complex. I don't think it's uh, complex at all, but just more involved. And what that means is there's additional topics, there's additional uh, information that you review and link and learn before you uh, tackle that advanced certification. And then we talked about the qualified experience volunteer test that's new this year. It's uh, 20 questions. And I imagine a lot of volunteers are going to go right to that test if their site coordinators say, yeah, let's do it. But again, every site coordinator is different. At my, at my site, I require my volunteers to certify on basic, advanced, and military. Uh, at uh, St. Killian, Fred, or whoever the site coordinator is, is going to uh, designate uh, whoever they're going to designate. And then the next one is the, the this is a really long uh, a title for a test, Federal Tax Law Update Test Only for Circuit or 230 Professionals. And so what that means is you've got your enrolled agents, your CPAs, um, your attorneys, uh, there's some other designations, but those are the big three. And those individuals, what they do is they're tax professionals and they come under what is called Treasury Circular 230 Rules of the Road for Tax Professionals. And if you take that test, like at my site, my CPAs and my enrolled agents at my site, they take that Circular 230 test and they're good to go, basically at the advanced level, if you will. And then of course, uh, on your, uh, your, volunteer, uh, your volunteer agreement, all of your tests are going to be populated. We're going to show you that. 
And then the military certification, uh, usually, um, again, my site, I require my, uh, my volunteers to certify in the military, which means we can handle the schedule E as an echo. And also you might have a reservist or someone who just got off the active duty and we can help them. Uh, it's not a complicated module, but it's a little bit more involved, a little bit more reading. Your international module, um, we've in the past at my site, we've had our, a couple people certify. What that is, is uh, people who are overseas, they might have some tax treaties that apply to their income. Uh, it is a little bit more involved, but typically you're, you're not going to see that at most VITA sites. Uh, foreign students, um, we've uh, had certifications before. The only site that uh, has it on a regular basis is Cal State Fullerton that I'm aware of, and that would be for students who are uh, from foreign countries. They're going to college in the United States, and they have U.S. sourced income, and um, in that case, we would file a, a tax return for them, but again, typically you won't see that. And in Puerto Rico, one and two, <clears throat> I've had people in the past say, Jerry, what's that all about? And my answer is, I don't know. I, I just know it's there. I've never taken it. I probably never will. But I will say this. Um, we have active duty members of the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton who are from Puerto Rico. And what that means is we've got uh, Marine volunteers, and they will take Puerto Rico 1 and 2, that uh, certification, and they will be able to assist those active duty Marines at Camp Pendleton. So if you know anybody from Puerto Rico and they're in Southern California and they're just, uh, they, they want their return done, uh, if they qualify to get on that base at Camp Pendleton in Southern California, they're going to find volunteers who are trained in the uh, module one and two. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop for just a moment and see if anybody has any questions about these various certifications on the Link and Learn program. <clears throat> Jerry, I have, I have a question. Sure. If, Who, who's that? This is Adela again. Okay. If, yes, Adela. I, like you, I usually take the basic and then the advanced just to jar my brain and, and get a little practice in. But, so if I do that, take the basic and then the advanced, can I go ahead and go to that 120 question thing and do it too, just for practice? You mean the qualified experience volunteer test? Yes. You know, I don't know. Uh, I have not seen the software. Um, yeah, I, I will have to wait until that software is posted. Okay. Thank you. Know. And, you know, that's a good point. A lot of people, I, I had one guy one time, I, I mean, good for him. He took all the certifications all the way down to Puerto Rico 1 and 2. He's very proud of himself and thinking, great job. But then again, we only used them for, for you know, basic and advanced because we didn't have those customers, the military international foreign students or folks in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> Okay, before we jump into the software, I want to go down to the, the, uh, the Lincoln Lab. I want to go down to the practice lab, and the practice lab is simply a place to practice. You're going to have to create an account. Uh, the software, we've been told, is going to be posted uh, on or about the 10th of November. So what that means is when you get into the practice lab, uh, you, you're going to have the option of selecting tax year 2020 or tax year 2019. And if you're only interested in 2020, that's great. Make sure that you click on that 2020. It should, should be coming up automatically. But again, you'll be able to use that software for that particular tax year. And then there, are, I'm gonna show you one of these. There's also tutorials. And uh, some of these tutorials I think are, are okay and others, I, I don't think I would use them, but there are tutorials, especially if you're brand new and you're not familiar with the, you, you know, uh, Form 1040, you, you can go to a tutorial. And then here's another thing the Practice Lab has. For 2019, it's probably going to be the same for 2020. There are practice returns and solutions. <clears throat> Good thing about the practice returns and solution is you have an, the ability to go there and practice returns because you're going to be given a scenario and then you can check your answers with the solution. Uh, the not so good thing is because we are based in California, uh, a lot of those returns are for Georgia taxpayers because I think tax layers based in, in Georgia. But nonetheless, it's a great place to practice. I think there's seven of them. And just a caution, one of them deals with a married filing separate taxpayer. Uh, in the state of California, we don't do married filing separate advice sites. <clears throat> and so you probably want to just uh, skip that one. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our uh, link. Uh, just a real quick uh, statement here um, for, for those who are uh, volunteering, new volunteers. 
uh, is that uh, when you create your account, make sure that you uh, really write it down and specify what exactly that account is for. And the reason being because there's a lot of confusion between the account, what you use for the IRS practice lab, as well as the real account, the TaxLayer Pro account and all that stuff. So to avoid confusion, just put in your notes, this is a practice lab. That way, there will be no confusion in your part because you know the more we are confused. I mean, we even the 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 volunteers who are already experienced, we sometimes get confused. I mean, I myself get confused, even though I'm an IT guy, right? So, just to make sure that that's you know you you wrote down a good note on that, just just for your own good. Uh, obviously, you can reset and all that stuff over your password and stuff, but it's better to have one practice lab account that you can always rely on. Okay. Yeah, see, that, that's a good point. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting there trying to enter the practice lab or enter Lincoln Learn. I'm thinking, hmm, I forgot my password. Uh, so you have to reset. But uh, yeah, just write it down. Okay, so hopefully, uh, Steve, can you let me know? Can you come off mute? And can you see a screen that says Lincoln Learn Taxes? We're still on, on introduction to Lincoln Learn. Yeah. What you can do, Jerry, is if you have two screens, do you have two screens or you only have one screen? Uh, I have one screen showing right now. Um, you, you can, uh, you can uh, minimize, um, is it on the same slide or on different slide? Or a different, it's a different well, slide, right? Steve, let me ask you this. What do you see on your screen? I'm seeing the introduction to Link and Learn, Tax, tax Layer Pro. Oh, okay. So you're seeing a PowerPoint presentation and you're not yeah. seeing the Link and Learn? Yes. Yeah, the Link and Learn, I, I believe, is your web website, right? Or web, web browser. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So you're seeing the PowerPoint. So let me do yeah. this. And let's, okay. So you well, can, just you can minimize your PowerPoint and then <clears throat> share your uh, screen and then share the content of the web browser. Okay, so give me, give me just a moment here and let me see if I can, uh, I can make this happen. This is the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And then let me see. Wow, you win for most icons. All right. So Steve, I'm gonna see if I can come back and, and see if uh, <clears throat> if you can see <clears throat> if you can see what we need to show you. Let me see if I can also, because um, I have the site open on my web browser as well, but let me see if I can also. Now, Steve? The website, Link and Learn. Yeah. So you, you, at the top of the uh, screen, yeah. you're looking at it, it says Yeah, Link we can see that, yeah. Yeah, we can Perfect. see Perfect. Okay, so, uh, so we are now with the screen that you would see if you were a brand new volunteer, you would go to the IRS website and uh, you would, Link and Learn or type in Link and Learn Taxes and you can see a screen something like this. <clears throat> so let's do this. Let's go to our certification paths. And our certification paths, this is for 2019. It'll probably look similar for uh, 2020. And so if you want to certify, you're going to tell the computer, let's say you're going to do the advanced certification. And let's say you are a student. And then you're going to see a tab that says start advanced course. And then you're going to see all of these various topics. And so if you're brand new, you're going to be using your publication 4012 and then all of these various topics. Let's go to this topic here that says filing status. You can open it up. And then you can go through what is called the skills workout. You can go through the various tutorials. And what we will do uh, through the next uh, five sessions, we're going to use a combination of the publication 4012, the tax layer program. Um, I won't rely on these, but again, these are available to you. So you can go back and review them before you take the certification. And we're going to have enough practice in the practice lab. So by the end of this experience in December, you're gonna know your way around the tax layer, tax preparation software. Okay. 
All right. And then down here where it says certification test, where it says test includes standards of conduct, you're eventually going to click on that and your computer is going to bring you to this screen right here. Steve, can you see where it says VITA TCE Central? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Now, if you're new, you should take a pencil or a pen out or a Crayola. <clears throat> and this is what you want to do. You want to register or create an account so you can take the certifications when you're ready to do that. So you're going to hit this uh, tab that says create an account. And then you're going to see a screen that says self registration. So I'm going to go through this. Uh, I'm not going to register because I'm already registered, but I'm going to show you a couple things. You are a VITA volunteer. Uh, TCE is an acronym. Um, and the way I understand it, we have AERP, which is a different program. And then we actually have a tax counseling for the elderly. And I think there is one site in Orange County that I'm aware of that is not associated with VITA and not associated with AERP. There's just a TE, TCE site. But you're a VITA volunteer. And you most likely do not want to take the site coordinator course. If you check yes, then what will happen is the software will bring that particular course for you to take. <clears throat> if you're an instructor and you're instructing VITA, you would click there. Most of you will put no. Uh, we know what IRS is. SPEC is an acronym for the Stakeholder Partnerships Education and Communication. That's a division in the IRS that does a few things to include run the VITA uh, program. If you're going to volunteer, you're going to click here. Yes. And then your training resource is going to be Link and Learn, your e-learning. And then this is important if you're brand new. You're going to type in your real name and your real last name. And as I said before, the IRS or a contractor for the government is not going to contact you to sell you shampoo or bars of soap. They're collecting data. This is for official uh, purposes. You can ignore the acronym SEID. That's for IRS employees. You'll create your own username and your own password. And then, like Steve said, you should write it down. And then it talks about complexity. They want eight characters. And then email. You want to type in some type of email address. That could be your business address, your school address, or your personal address. And then you want to put in some type of address. And that address could be your business address, your school address, or your personal address. And they're looking for a phone number. <clears throat> and then down here, if you want to, your parent organization, you can put in St. Killian's if you want. For, if, for those folks who are professional uh, tax preparers, uh, that would be your CPA, your enrolled agents, your attorneys, and that's where you're going to uh, put that in. But if you're not one of those, you can ignore it. P10 is a practitioner identification number. If you're not a practitioner, you can ignore it. Uh, CTEC is the California Tax Education Council, and if you are a tax preparer in California and you're not one of those big three, you got to belong to CTEC. If you're not a CTEC person, you can ignore it. So once you enter all of that data and hit register, then you're good to go. And I'll say this one more time because, again, I can't tell you how many times I have goofed this up over the years. I would write down your information so that way you can readily access your link and learn and take your certifications. Okay, so we're all done with that. We've uh, we've registered, and now what we're going to do, we're going to go the certification test. And so you're all registered, and now you're ready to enter the certifications. Once you've read the material, you familiarize yourself with the publication 40, uh, 4012, and you practice on the practice lab. And so let me go ahead and put in my username. and my password and let's see if it works okay great i'm in and so it's going to look something like this again this is for 2019 you can see up here 2019 and then you can see the various certifications and uh this is uh yeah this is for kathleen that's not my stage name that's uh that's my wife she's sitting right next to me and so you've got the standards of conduct examination so she did that, and then she receives a certificate, which is posted in the software, which you can download if you want. And then here's that intake and interview quality review. She took that. She got 100%. That's pretty good. And then this is the circular 230 for professionals. She did not take that. And you can see over here, you have uh, two choices, or excuse me, two attempts. And this is something I've told 
people probably about a thousand times. I tell people, if you're going to take the certification, what you should do, you should prepare yourself for it. And if you were unsuccessful the first time, then you should go ahead and stop. You should review the material that you were unsuccessful at and then go back at it. What a lot of people do, they jump into it minutes later and they flunk it or they are unsuccessful the second time. And then your site coordinator has uh, some types of uh, uh, provisions, if you will, for you to get certified. But I recommend just take your time. If you're unsuccessful the first time, take your time. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was working with an enrolled agent who was teaching with us and he flunked the basic certification. And I told them, okay, well, that happens. You, that, that means you just didn't read the material. Read the material, practice with the practice lab, and you're going to be okay. Uh, I've, got people, I've got people in my class right now, my basic VITA class. They've never even seen a Form 1040 before, fine at the basic level. Okay. Let's see. And then you go to the next tab, basic. Advanced. Now, I usually get 100, but uh, my, uh, my spouse did not. But that's okay because all you need to do, all you need to do is get an 80% and you're going to pass. Uh, some people get very excited. They want 100%. And okay, then get your, get your 100%, but uh, you only need 80% to pass. Again, the health savings account will be incorporated in the advanced certification. Military. Um, Again, that's a certification. Not many sites will have their military certification. Uh, and I've mentioned this to Fred before. If Fred gets a customer who's an active duty a military member or reservist or just got off active duty, uh, you can come to Coastline College. We, we've got our folks who are trained in, in the military exam. International, not so much. Um, you just don't see that very often. Again, those are people who are living and working overseas and sometimes tax treaty provisions will apply to them. Uh, it's not complex, it's just more involved. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you have a situation where someone has that, uh, you can uh, refer them to a site. And sometimes our site at Coastline have, have international certified folks. And then the Puerto Rico thing I told you about, I've never certified on that. But again, if you have taxpayers who are Puerto Rican, they can go, if they qualify, they can go to the Camp Pendleton base and they can uh, get people to help them out. Okay, so let's point out a couple other things over here. We're in, uh, let's go back to our basic. Again, your certificates. Let me, see, let me show you what a certificate looks like. And Steve, uh, if you can come off mute and let me know if you can see a certificate here. There it is. Yes, we do. We okay. Say. Yeah, and, and, and uh, Kathleen, that's my spouse. She also volunteers from time to time at, uh, at a couple sites. So this is what your standards of conduct certificate looks like. And uh, at my site, I do not require my uh, volunteers to provide the certification. I, I, I require them to provide the form 13615, which we're gonna show you that. All right, let me get out of this. <clears throat> And then, so that's a certificate. Now over here, it talks about the volunteer agreement. And let's click here where it says volunteer agreement. Once you certified, then what will happen is the 13615 will populate in the Link and Learn program. And the 13615, this is the document that your site coordinator wants you to provide either electronically or a hard copy. So it has the information above about uh, standards of conduct, doing the right thing. And this is part of your volunteer standards of conduct training. You're not going to accept payment. Uh, quality site requirements, that's, the, uh, that's in your material and your site coordinator will provide that information to you. And here's something, this happens all the time. <clears throat> um, I'm, a, I'm a tax guy and people ask me, Jerry, um, they, they're not going to be able to help me at this particular site. So you're a tax guy. Can you do my return? And my answer is, uh, no, I'm not going to do your return. I'm not going to solicit business. Go out in town and find someone. I'll guide them, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to solicit for business. You just don't do that. So if you're an insurance salesperson, don't sell insurance. Uh, if you're a, a counselor, don't sell your counseling service. Just don't solicit business. That's not the purpose. Your purpose is to prepare a return if you can. We talked about this. Um, 
very, very infrequently preparing a false return, which means uh, you're in cahoots with someone, you're doing something that's bad. But when you do that, you've crossed a line, you'll, you'll be released from the program and uh, who knows, maybe the IRS will, will knock into your and say, hey, we need to talk to you, but just don't do it. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. And then there's other things that you read about in the uh, volunteer standards of conduct. Yeah. Like you say, the golden rule, um, no yelling, no screaming, no profanity. Um, you know, just be pleasant. Now you can be firm with people and I've done it before where I've told people, sir, uh, we're not going to do your return. This is, this is why you're not going to, this is why we're not going to do your return. So your options are you can pick up your papers and you can leave or we'll eventually have someone remove you from the site. Again, care bear language, but you're going to see that. You're going to see people who are difficult and uh, who start yelling and screaming from time to time. It doesn't happen that often, but you got to use your, uh, your powers of persuasion and tell them, sorry, can't help you, you got to leave. But again, that happens very infrequently. And again, uh, if people do not comply with all of the standards that they agree to, it really amounts to this for the individual. Um, and I've done this before. Uh, they are essentially released or they're told, hey, we're not going to use your services anymore. Thanks for volunteering. But for these reasons, uh, we're not going to use you anymore. It doesn't happen that often because 99.9% .9 of the people invited, they want to do the right thing. They want to help people out because it's a great program. Okay, this is, your, this is your money slide right here. This is page two of the form 13615. This is your agreement form. And so the top part of the document is going to have your administrative data. And I always tell people, you know something, give me your phone number. I don't know why she left her phone number off, but uh, maybe I already had it. But uh, my volunteers, I ask them, hey, give me your phone number, put it on the form because I'm sitting there at the site and I got to call you and I don't have your number. And I look at 13615, I'm thinking, well, maybe they'll answer the email, maybe not. Give me your phone number, give me your phone number. And then you can see right here, the number of years volunteering. And then down here, the certification levels, the P means pass. And so everybody's gonna have that standards of conduct and if you're involved in the program, helping out taxpayers, you're going to have that intake and interview. Um, and then at a minimum, you're going to have the basic certification, the basic certification. In this case, she took the advance and she passed it. And of course, this will look a little bit differently from the 2020 because we now have a, a couple, uh, uh, couple of differences. We don't have HSA anymore. And then we have that, uh, that other certification that we talked about. And then down here, this is for your circuit of 230 professionals, and they can earn continuing education credits. And for, I don't know how many professionals we have on the call here. We might have some CPAs and enrolled agents, but you can see this data down here. You're going to populate this data in the software. You're going to tell the software who you are and whether or not you got your, uh, your bar card or license number. Uh, if you're a CPA, you get some type of number. Uh, down here, if you're an enrolled agent, you got to check if you're an enrolled agent. If you're a member of CTEC, uh, Katie's a member of CTEC, she'll put her number down here in the software along with her peak. And all of that data, again, is captured. At the very bottom of the 13615, again, this is for folks who want continuing education. Uh, you can see down here their levels and the number of hours. Gotcha. Or someone's going to sign, and for St. Killian, I'm going to make a conclusion. I might be wrong. I'm going to say that probably Fred Ramos is going to sign. Fred, are, is that going to be correct for those people who are tax professionals and want CE credit? Yes, I signed it and I sent it to the spec and uh, uh, to to get the credits uh, as required. Okay, and, and and a vast majority of people in the Vita program, they're not going to be one of those uh, tax professionals. They're going to be uh, volunteers, and so. They're concerned about their volunteer certification level, and they're going to get this document to uh, uh, to Fred or the site coordinator at St. Killian's or whoever your site coordinator is. So, any questions about the form thirteen six one five? Do we have any uh, Do we have any new volunteers on the call that want to come off mute? And I want to ask them a softball question. Let's see, I see Cindy Peterson, are you a returning volunteer or a new volunteer? Returning. Okay, can I ask you a softball question? Okay. 
Uh, Cindy, um, what level do you plan on certifying this coming season? Ultimately, I'd like to do the advanced, but I'm going to do the basic first. Okay, so you, you're going to certify at basic and advanced, and so then what would happen is uh, on your 13615, a P for basic and a P for advanced. Okay. And then what I do, I recommend this. Uh, of course, you know, we're in an electronic world, and so uh, I will ask my volunteers to, again, give me a copy of this. I print it out. I, I keep it in a folder at my Vita site, and then uh, I will visit Vita sites from time to time when people invite me. And so I make a photocopy of my 13615. I show up, and then that site coordinator says, hey, thanks, thanks for showing up, Jerry, but before we put you to work, you've got to show me your 13615 and some type of government-issued ID. So I'll show them those documents. They're, okay, you can go to work now. So that happens because you have some people who, uh, who run the circuit and will volunteer at various sites. I would caution you, though, I would not recommend showing up to a site uninvited. If you want to work at a site, you should contact the site coordinator and say, hey, site coordinator, I'd like to work this day. Uh, can you use me? And they'll say, yeah. And they'll ask you a couple questions. And when you show up, they want to see that 13615. Don't show up uninvited. That, um, that's, that's not a good thing. OK. Any other? Uh, Jerry, this is John. I'm, I work for IRS in uh, Laguna Niguel. Um, I am in uh, transfer pricing area, so I will get. Uh, I wanted to get the advanced certification. Okay, great. And you brand new? Uh, no, I, I volunteered last year for Sats and Kenny. I'm in I'm in Cerritos, but I commuted to to Lake Forest to volunteer. So, yeah. Are you a revenue agent? I'm a senior revenue agent. I'm more like a transfer pricing specialist. Okay, great, great. And uh, so you certified last year, so you're familiar with the form? I kind of joined later, like back uh, back in February. I am a CPA, so I may have to do the certification this year. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you want to volunteer, everybody has to certify. And then, of course, if you're a, uh, if you're a CPA and you want uh, credits, uh, then, of course, you have to enter that data. Into Got it. I'll do that, yeah. So, okay. uh, Jerry, uh, um, Jana and Barad were our volunteer last year as well at St. Killian. So um, uh, just a real quick question. I don't know if you want to talk more about it later, but I'm just going to ask you now because me, even I'm, I've been a volunteer for eight years, I'm still having a little bit confusion and somebody else may want to uh, join in uh, on the discussion. Can you talk more or are you going to talk about it later about the healthcare savings uh, certification? A part of it. Uh, if you go back to the second, go back yes. to the lab and the link learning. Yes. What what we're going to do, and not not today. I think it'll okay. be three. We're going to go to that advanced uh, um, training, and we're going to explain what the health savings count is and how to enter data into the software when you have someone who's been issued an information return who has health savings account. So the the short answer is yes. Thank you. Okay, all right, a couple more things and then we'll jump into our practice lab. So now you've seen the volunteer form, the 13615. Um, those of you, and I know I spent a lot of time on the CE credits, but this has been a big issue because if you're a tax professional and you're spending time, well, it, one of the benefits is getting your, your credits. So you, you click here if you're one of those tax professionals and get your CE credit document. And this looks like it's not populating. Okay, it's not populating. And your voluntary standards of conduct course, uh, we've already talked about um, the uh, document and it looks like can't, I cannot open that up for whatever reason. But again, you'd click here. Hopefully you can still see this where it says volunteer standards of conduct course. Here's your training document where you would open up and you'd review. Or you go right to my slide deck and you can see that laundry list of documents and you can, you can go to the IRS website and you can retrieve the training material for the volunteer standards of conduct. And then same thing with the intake and interview. I can't open this up. This is the training, i.e. The, uh, the PowerPoint, where you can review that. And again, that's uh, something available on uh, the IRIS website. OK, so I think that's it. Let's get out of here. And so all right. Steve, can you still hear me? My, my screen's gone wacko. Yeah, you just minimize your browser right now. That's uh, easy for you to say. <laughs> just uh, close it if you can. Uh, we don't um, 
we're showing like a Microsoft website. Yeah, there you go. And then we share your screen again with your. Um... All right. Yeah, you can tell I am not a. Uh, there's a lot of things I'm not. And one thing I'm not is a uh, is a computer guy like Steve. Okay. Uh, let's... You're doing pretty good, Jerry. You're doing excellent. So don't worry. Uh, what's that one saying? I do what I can. All right. Okay. Let's go back to our our, um, our document here. So. Hold on just a moment here. Let me see if I can open this up. Thank you. Maybe be a good time to take a break. Yeah. It's 1050, yes. Wait a second. Okay, so we're gonna go back to, so again, we talked about Link and Learn. We talked about Link and Learn. We've shown you how to get to Link and Learn, how to create an account, and then how to jump into those certification modules. And as I said before, the module certifications it is self-paced and it is open book. And I will say this, uh, whether you are a, uh, a certified public accountant or an IRS revenue agent or volunteer, first, first year volunteer, when you take the certifications, you should have that publication 4012 next to you because that's your go-to document. Uh, because if you start guessing, you, know, you might uh, get below 80%, frustrate yourself and say, gee whiz, now I gotta take it again. Okay, uh, so let's go to the practice lab. And I think we tried this once before. Let's try it and see if it, uh, it opens up. Steve, can you see where it says Link and Learn Taxes? Um, I'm seeing your PowerPoint. Okay, all right, no problem. Let me go ahead and go to let me go to the link and learn. And Steve, can you, let's see if I can load this up. Can you see the Vita TCE uh, landing yeah. page? Yeah, perfect. Okay. You see it. All right. And there's a couple ways to get to the practice lab. No matter which way you use, you just want to get to the practice lab. So let's go to the practice lab. And then uh, this used to be a, uh, uh, Confuse people, but it's uh, the materials there. So the password is Train Pro Web, all uppercase, all one word. Can you put that in the chat box? You want you want that in the chat box? Yes. I can. I can. That means I got to find the chat box now. Hold on. Um, Here we go. Found it. All right, here's here's your um yeah bernard already uh, put it in the past okay yeah someone's already put it in it's all one word it's train pro web all right let me go back to this Okay, and so if you have not created an account, then what you'll do, you'll create an account to utilize the practice lab. So you hit create an account. And you can see right here, you're gonna enter data for your email address. And uh, again, business, school, or personal. You're gonna create your username and your password. Hey, Jerry, we, we, I think uh, we're not seeing your screen. Uh, you can't see it? No, we cannot see it. So, um, all right. Then we're going to do. We're going to do take. We're going to do take two, as they say in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So here's the practice lab again. Train Pro Web. And Steve, can you see where it says? Username and password, yes. Okay, great. So if you're brand new, you create an account. If you're like me, I forget all sorts of stuff. You click on forget password and follow the prompts. When you create an account, you're gonna enter data for your email, your password, 
your program type. And for most of us, it'll probably either be VITA or AERP tax aid. And then down here where it says SIDN, uh, that stands for site identification number. If you know that, plug it in. If you don't, you can leave it uh, blank. And then to use the famous words of Steve, the ID, I, IT guy, for your password to recover, you want to write that down, whatever your security question is, and then your security answer, and then you'll create an account. So it's pretty basic. And again, you're entering your, your information, but uh, the IRS or the contractor for the government is not going to contact you to sell you uh, tires or shampoo. Okay, so we're back to the sign-in. So I'm going to see if I can sign in, if I remember my, uh, my password. Steve, I remembered my password. Okay, what we're gonna do here before we jump into the practice lab, because this is gonna get more and more involved. Again, not complex, just more and more involved. Let's go ahead and take a break. It's uh, 1056, let's come back at 1105 and we'll jump into the practice lab. See you at 1105 in page. Can you come off mute? I can, but I still can't sign in. I asked for a username retrieval and nothing is coming through my email. So. Can, can, can you see on the screen my uh, my display of the practice lab where it says practice lab home? Yes, we yeah, see yes, yours. Yes, I okay, see it. Great. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through this for the next uh, 50 some odd minutes. So uh, whether you're new or used, if this is a landing page and when you're gonna enter data into the software, you're going to click on that tab that says go to practice area. Whether you're new or, uh, or a returning volunteer, you can see there's a lot of information in the practice lab landing page. And so if you are a site coordinator, it shows you how to set things up. If you want to get additional training, you can come down here. These are tutorials. If you're brand new, starting a tax return in the software and all of this information down here on the left-hand side of the screen. If you want to take advantage of those practice returns in practice lab, you can see practice return one. I'm gonna open up just number one and show you how this works as far as retrieving the, uh, the information. And so you're gonna see over here where it says attachments. And when you click on there, you get the practice scenario. We'll open that up. And so this will give you a practice uh, tax return or scenario, and you can use this and you can enter this data into the software once you have access to the software and practice a return. And then when you want to check your answers, you come to the solution. And this solution, if, if you might remember this, if you're a returning volunteer, this is what it looks like on that first couple pages. It has information about the uh, return. And then when your cursor down, you're eventually going to form 1040. After you get past all those other forms, there you go. So this is your solution to practice return number one in the practice lab uh, program. And check your answers. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get out of that and get out of that. And again, you could probably spend about two or three weeks on all this stuff that they've uh, loaded up here. There's a lot of information. And if you're brand new, it's, it's good to, uh, to check a few of those out and even the tutorials off on the left-hand side. Okay, now we're gonna go to the practice lab. And you probably wanna grab a pencil because um, there's a couple things that uh, you may have uh, forgotten from last year or if you're brand new. And so when you're starting a new return, you can see right here, it says 2019. This is for tax year 2019. And if you want to change the year, you'd go to our choices are 18 or 19. Some sites will prepare previous uh, returns or past year returns. Some sites do current year only. We're going to go ahead and open up a return. And in the practice lab, your first 
three digits will be four zero zero. And so in this case, I'll make up a uh, I'll make up a social that hasn't been taken before. And then I'm gonna hit start to return. And so this looks familiar to you. Now what I'd like you to do, if you would, if you could go ahead and if you have a publication 4012, if you could open up your publication 4012. And if you don't have one, then you'd have to go to the IRS website, type in 4012, and then one would populate. So let's go to, um, Give me just a second here. Since you're using the 2019 return, we'll open up the 4012 for 2019 returns. Uh, you know, for, for instructional purposes, you can use the 2019. If you have the 2020 open, that'll, that'll work also. Either one. Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the publication 4012 for tax year 2020. And if you have the 2019 one, you wanna find the screen. It should, be, it should be on page Bravo 8. And the document says determination of filing status decision tree. So you wanna find that document in your 4012 titled determination of filing status decision tree. And then I'm, get, I'm gonna call on someone and I'm gonna ask him some really softball questions. Let's see, is it pronounced uh, Anna Bofa? Anna, could you come off mute? Hi. All right, Anna, hello. Are you, are you a returning volunteer or a new Yes, volunteer? yes. Returning? Actually okay. AARP, but okay. <laughs> okay, great. Hey Anna, um, I want you to pretend that you are a tax preparer and I am the tax payer. And I want to use that decision tree to determine my filing status. Okay. Well. And so you would go to the, the decision tree and you would start with to start here and ask me that first question. Uh, were you married on the last day of last year? Of this year? <laughs> uh, let's see. I uh, I was uh, I was not married on the last day of the year. I was married all the way until November tenth, and then finally the divorce came uh, through, and I was a single guy at the last day of the year. Okay. Um, did your spouse? die during the year? No, um, the marriage died. Uh, she, she left, I left, but no, she's still living. <clears throat> <laughs> um, okay, well, you, uh, Mary, finally joined me. Uh, did you and your spouse, uh, Let's see. Okay, so did you filed a separate, uh, let's see. Did you guys, did you and your spouse live apart uh, all of the last six months of the year? No, we, we, uh, we got divorced. Uh, it came through in November. So at the end of the year, on December 31st, um, we were not legally married. Okay. And so Anna, I'm going to give you a hint. So if you're looking at the decision tree, then you would go to the left hand side of that decision tree and mm -hmm. that big box that says, did all of the following apply? Your spouse died. The answer is no. So it no. bounced down to that second box. Okay. Both of the following apply and none of that stuff applies because I'm no. a dude. And where would that uh, take you? That would take you to single. 
Okay, great. And, and typically what's going to happen at the AERP site or the VITA site, determining filing status is going to be pretty quick, but I would caution you, I, I, I always use this decision tree because I can't tell you how many times I've asked people, are you married? And they look at me and they start daydreaming. They go, I, I don't know. And I'm thinking, all right, well, let me ask the 20 questions. Uh, what happened? Well, we were getting divorced in Rhode Island and uh, I don't know if it's official yet. Okay. Well, we're going to put things on pause, call the clerk of the court, determine if the, uh, if the judge has issued a, uh, a divorce decree or divorce order, and let's find out if, you know, what your status is at the end of the year. But I, I use the decision tree. Some people don't, but you should, because you never know what you're going to bump into. Uh, so anyway, this guy is single. Thanks. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so you, you see right here on the screen, let me see if I can make this larger. And then of course it asks for your uh, taxpayer name. So let's come up with a name. And usually you don't have issues with names, but occasionally some person says, well, um, my name is this. And so I tell them, hey, can you take out your social security card and can you show me your, your legal name? You, usually that's not an issue, sometimes it is. Date of birth, you're gonna get that from the taxpayer. Usually I don't have an issue with that, but sometimes taxpayers cannot remember when their kids were born. That's okay, you can look at documents. Uh, sometimes they have to retrieve the birth certificate. Typically you, you, you're able to find that information. Occupation, uh, we'll ask them what their occupation is. Down here, you can see all of these questions. And uh, some of the questions that pop up, you may have a taxpayer who's blind according to the tax definition of blind. If you get into the publication 17, it explains the tax definition of blindness. Uh, sometimes you'll have a mother, we've seen this a lot at the sites I've worked at. Mothers will show up with information about their deceased son, or you might have a taxpayer with a deceased sister, and that person is the representative. So uh, you can still complete a return for the decedent, but you'd have to check there. And then a lot of people get spun up about this one. Do they want money to go to the presidential election campaign? I always tell people this is not going to affect your refund. Uh, you're simply issuing an order to the government to segregate monies for this fund. And then of course, if a candidate qualifies, then they start getting money from the fund. Uh, combat zone, you don't see that unless you're working at a military site. If someone has served in a combat zone, you check there. And what that means is uh, their wages will be run through W-2. If they're enlisted personnel, none of their military wages will be taxed if they're in a uh, combat zone. But again, the military certification talks about uh, that. Okay, address, we're gonna put that in. And uh, let's see, um, who's that revenue agent? Was, was, was the name John? Can you come off mute? Who's that revenue agent? It's John, John. Uh, how do you spell your first name? John, is it J-O-H-N? It was a lady. Which, which, it's, it was John. So you're talking about the, the revenue agent? The revenue no, agent. Not me, is he, John. Is John still with us? It was a woman. Is that woman still with us? Yeah, revenue agent, there. come off mute, talk to us. <laughs> Are you still with us? I am still with you. No. Excellent, okay, so you're an IRS employee? Yeah. Let me yes. ask a question, softball question. What, why do we want a correct and current address for taxpayers? What's the importance there? Okay, to send the, for, for a few things. One is to send their refund. Uh, that's one thing. And then uh, follow up uh, for any, any updates. And then the second thing would be, I think it's tied to the voter registration, but I'm not sure. You know, you are correct. It's a statutory requirement that taxpayers provide their current address to the Internal Revenue Service because if you need a document, the IRS is going to send something out. They're going to send it to your last known address. I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to, hundreds and hundreds, who say, hey, the IRS didn't send me documents. And the IRS says, yes, we did. We sent it to the last known address. And guess what? It never got to you. So it's on you. So, yeah, you want to, I tell all my clients, I tell all my friends and enemies, Make sure when you move, you tell the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board, all your friends, your relatives, 
anybody that you want to have your current address, send them your address to include the IRS. That's important. And if you know anything about a statutory notice of deficiency, those are sent yeah. to the last known address. And 30, uh, I know the, yeah. yeah. What's that? Days. They, a lot of them are 30 days expiration, you know, before they- You betcha, yeah. you betcha. So, so, so the mantra is make sure they have the current address for the taxpayers. Okay, so we've entered that. Jerry, it's Paul Abrams. Uh, can the address be a PO box or does it need to be a physical address? Uh, you know, um, what I remember, and somebody jump in if I'm wrong, what I remember is you can provide an address to the IRS and that can be a PO box. Like my dad used to live out in the middle of nowhere. He didn't even have phone services before cell phones. He had a PO box in town and that was his uh, address. So if the IRS wanted to send something to him, they would send it to the PO box. You know, on, on the state also, they look at the address also. That's one of the factors. They look at the residency in a particular state. So it, it has a lot more effect. Uh, sure, having sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so since we're in California, this is this is going to pop Hi, Dad. up. Hi, Dan. The California return. So oh, good news, huh? Yeah. Okay, can someone go on mute? Okay, all right. So did your name change? The answer is probably going to be no. Renter's credit. This is a non-refundable credit in the state of California. Of course, you have to qualify. And it says right here, the renter's credit is automatically if you answer yes. So we're going to put down yes. And if it's not, if it's not, if it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. Use tax. Um, let's see. How about Scott? Scott, can you tell us what use, use tax is? Use tax, uh, California has a requirement that you pay sales tax on materials purchased in California. Use tax is the same tax for materials which were obtained from outside California for which California sales tax was not charged. Okay, you have me make that point. That's correct. Okay, That's correct. all right. And uh, it, can you go on mute? We're getting some uh, some chatter there. And so what that means is if you buy a $200,000 recreational vehicle in Montana and you pay 5% sales tax, and then you drive it to California and you're a California resident, when you, uh, when you register that $200,000 RV, the DMV is gonna say, hey, you gotta pay tax. The difference between the sales tax in Montana and the sales tax in California. So you're gonna be writing a big check. In this case, zero and then down here says um obligation paid to the cdtfa that's an acronym for the california department of tax and Fee administration that is a state agency that was set up a few years ago and uh, they do a number of things to include they're the sales tax people in california the board of equalization used to be the sales tax people because of corruption the state legislature stripped the boe of that uh, responsibility and stood up the CDTFA, and now they're the sales tax people. I can add something. Go ahead. I'd like to suggest that we encourage our screeners on the intake form to in, enter the renter's credit, credit question um, when interviewing clients, because that's not on the, on the intake form, and the tax preparer invariably has to go back and try to figure that out. That's a good point. That's a good point. And renter's credit means you're, you're in California, you're, uh, you're living in California, and you pay rent to a landlady or landlord uh, more than, uh, I think it's more than six months. Okay, in this case, our taxpayer is single, has no dependents. And now we're going to open up the income screen. And for the vast majority of our taxpayers, we're going to be entering data for a W-2. If you're brand new, you probably want to take out a pencil and make a couple of notes. Typically, you're going to be dealing with a taxpayer that has a standard W-2. A corrected W-2 would be an amended W-2. Remember, when I was an IRS employee, the IRS issued me an incorrect W-2, and then I had to get a corrected W-2 from the IRS. So even the IRS makes mistakes. Uh, substitute W-2, that would be for an individual that has year-end data from pay stubs, and for some reason they can't get their hands on a W-2, they can go ahead and complete the substitute W-2. I've never seen a railway W-2. I guess they exist. Okay. Next, we have the EIN. The EIN is an acronym for the employer identification number. And on your W-2, you're going to have an EIN. So you're going to go ahead and key it as you see it. Pick up a number here. Name of the employer auto-populates. 
And then down here, wages, this is right off the W-2. In this case, I'm gonna give this guy 50K. Federal tax withheld, uh, this is uh, something most individuals have. Your very, very low income taxpayers may have little to no federal income tax withheld, but most of them will. And right here are boxes three, four, five, and six auto populate. And what that means is you have FICA or social security wages. Typically it'll be the same as your box one, unless there's some type of perhaps maybe a 401k contribution. And then social security tax, over here. Sometimes the amount that auto populates is different than the, what you have on your W-2. If that's the case, you can make the changes because the mantra is we're going to key it as we see it. And then Medicare tax on Medicare wages, again, auto population. A couple other things on your form W-2. Box 12 is used very often. There's a whole bunch of codes here. And you know something? Those codes are listed in your publication 4012. Typically, you're going to use the D as in delta. That's deferred compensation, perhaps maybe a 401k. Or you're going to have DD, and that would be some type of health insurance paid by the employer for the employee. Typically, a subsidy. There are some employers that pay the full boat, the full amount. In this case, this young person or this person has uh, employer paying uh, health insurance premiums for them to the tune of, let's say, $4,000. Over here in box 13, statutory employees, you don't see that very often. Statutory employees, they can report their income and their expenses on a Schedule C as in Charlie, but you don't see that very often. Retirement plan, there are some folks that still have a retirement plan at work and that would be checked. Third party pay, I think I've seen that two or three times in my entire career. Down here in box 14, these are your occupational insurance programs, meaning they are compulsory. And in the state of California, there is a disability insurance program. That's the California State Disability Insurance. Not everybody pays it, but a lot of people do. So for example, let's say you're working at Starbucks, you're going to pay into that program. And when you get sick or injured, and if you qualify, then the state will send you a disability check. Other people do not uh, pay into that. Like for example, when I was an IRS employee, I never paid into it. And now teach uh, at a couple colleges, I don't pay into it. In fact, I've never paid into it. Jerry, Paul Abrams. Um, Go ahead, Paul. Do, do you enter cent, dollars and cents or just round to the dollar? on some of these entries. You know what, what I do, I enter dollars and cents and then what happens is the computer will either round down or round up. But um, yeah, I, that's what I do. Um, your, site, your, your site coordinator may have different, uh, a different uh, information for you, but I would enter the exact amount. Thank you. Yes, Sonny. Okay. Hi, Dad. It. Yeah, you round up. Okay, uh, please go on uh, mute if you're, uh, if you're out there in Zoom land, California. And we talked about earlier staying within scope. Um, okay. I'm okay. Mission to him up. I'll pick you up at 1.30. Please go on mute. Thanks. I've had situations where people say, hey, Jerry, um, come on now. You're the only game in town. Can you do my return? I, I, I was in California. I got some Arizona. Thing. I got uh, two state returns I got to complete. And I've got one return. And my answer is no. Because once you open up that door, you're going to have people lining up at your Vita site saying, well, can you do it? a New Mexico return? Can you do a Utah return? The answer is no. Uh, in the VITA program, it's California and federal return. You also have a state EIN number, so you're going to put that in for the W-2, key it as you see it. If you're new, you want to make note of this. On uh, line 17, it says state tax paid. It really should say California state income tax withheld from an employee's paycheck. And uh, so if they have withholding, you're going to plug that in. And so we'll put an amount in there. Yay! What's that? Oh, thought I had a question. Okay, local wages, um, to my knowledge, uh, last time I checked, there is only one jurisdiction in the state of California that has an individual income tax, and that's the state of California. Uh, so we're not going to populate 18, 19, and 20. If you're working with someone as a practitioner, you might have, like I have, I have clients from New York City, and so they pay income tax to the city, of, excuse me, to the city of New York, and that's that local income tax, but we don't have that in California. 
your state wages and your federal wages typically to be in the same amount. Um, but I, I, you know, I've seen examples like, for example, uh, four or five years ago, I was living in Cuba and I had to uh, report my federal wages for my W-2, but the state of California did not tax my wages. So it was zero in box 16, and, but I did have an amount in box one for federal wages. All right, then we're gonna hit continue. When you hit continue, you save the data. You save the data. And in this particular case, this taxpayer has W-2 income and we're gonna give him one other type of income and this is a 1099 INT. You can see right here, interest and dividend income. And you click there where it says interest income and you enter data. And this is something if you're, if you're returning, you know this, um, if a taxpayer does not have a 1099 INT, what that means is they don't have an information return. If they have received interest income, whether it's a dollar or $10,000, they're gonna report it on their return. Uh, but typically they'll have some document that'll, be, uh, that'll look like a 1099 INT. It might be information at the bottom of their bank statement. So we're gonna put in a bank name. The only name I know is Chase. Interest income, let's say this person has $15 of interest income. You do see this, and I think this is on one of the certifications, the early withdrawal penalty. And what that means is um, you, uh, you break a certificate of deposit, which is a contract. And because you've broken a contract, the bank is gonna withhold a certain amount of interest because you've broken the contract. And that would be an early withdrawal penalty. Let's put down $6 for this guy. Federal tax withheld, typically you don't see that on a 1099, but you might have uh, perhaps maybe a, a senior taxpayer comes in and they may have uh, you know fifty or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, and they they have a withholding there. That's that that could be that could be. So then you're just going to follow the uh, the 1099 key it as you see it. To continue, you can save the data. Okay, at this point, um, we are going to we are going to go to health insurance because we've entered data. This is a basic return, very simple, and there's nothing else. And we're gonna to go to health insurance and I'll make a couple of points here. Um, this health insurance questionnaire, we know that in 2019 and in 2020, uh, there's no such thing as the uh, individual share responsibility payment for the federal government. That doesn't exist anymore. And so what that means is if you do not have health insurance, you don't have health insurance, but you don't pay that federal penalty in 2020. There is a state penalty though. In this case, this individual had insurance through his employer, so he's not in covered California or the marketplace. And we're gonna hit uh, continue there. And that should prompt the uh, software to bounce me to this slide. State return, we're gonna talk about this, uh, I believe on the fifth the nitty gritty, but if you have to make changes in the California return, you hit that pencil, opens up various tabs, a lot of the stuff is done automatically, but sometimes you're gonna to have to enter data. And we're gonna have a bunch of changes to that healthcare mandate because in 2020, this is 2019 uh, software, in 2020, California has their own mandate. And then you see a couple things here that says addition and subtraction. This is usually done automatically, but sometimes you gotta jump in there. When you hear the term subtraction from income, what that means is the federal government taxes things that the state of California does not. The federal government taxes the California lottery winnings. The federal government taxes unemployment compensation. The federal government taxes, in some cases, a portion of the social security uh, income. The state of California doesn't tax any of that stuff. Okay, we're not gonna make any entries here. So we're gonna exit and then hit continue. And this should look familiar to most of you. Uh, let's see, Steve, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Can you come off, oh, you're off mute. Can you let me know if you can see a PDF document for our taxpayer? His last name is Silva, John Silva. Yes, I'm seeing Silva. Okay, great. And can you see the screen enlarged? Yeah. Um, Jerry, can you, um, uh, uh, zoom it in, like make it smaller. There's something on the top of it that I want to highlight first. 
um, uh, go go up in your sidebar so that I can because there was something there about Adobe. Uh, I want to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, yeah, there you go uh, in the bottom, right beneath beneath the print your tax return. So go okay. down a little. Yeah, there you go. Don't. Yeah, as you can see right there, there's a download the latest Adobe. Um, just keep in mind that it's in there and the reason being because it will automatically open up your PDF program. If you don't have one, it will open up what Jerry is opening right now directly in the Tax Layer Pro, which is a web-based PDF reader. Uh, the problem with that is later on, if you want to print that, you may have an issue with that. So I would recommend having an Adobe reader uh, PDF uh, format or a fax it reader or any kind of uh, real free PDF reader. Okay. So just highlight that. All right, Jerry, just that's a side note for me. Thank okay, you. great. So there okay, you go. So yeah, here's, here's, your, here's your package and um, it has the name of the taxpayer. Uh, it has the practice lab information, the various forms. And this is a sheet that has a uh, a, uh, a total, a summary total of your federal and your, your state information. And if you're brand new, what will happen is the software will, uh, will generate the W-2 that you entered and it'll look like this. And this is uh, a W-2. And as I said before, sometimes your taxpayers will have two or more W-2s. So you just, in that interview process, you wanna ask them, hey, where'd you work and were you a wage earner? And then they'll typically have their W-2s Here's another thing. Sometimes people, and I've seen this a lot, they go, hey, I've got my W-2 on my electronic device. I'm thinking, okay, that's fine. Uh, we don't need a paper W-2. We just need the data from your electronic device. If you're returning, you know what this is. This is the Form 8879, which is a document that the taxpayer signs, and that allows the electronic return originator to, uh, to file the return electronically. The vast majority of returns in the VITA program are filed electronically. And sometimes they reject, and what happens is we call the taxpayer, we try to perfect the return. If it's not able to be perfected, then we tell the return, or excuse me, we tell the taxpayer, taxpayer, we can't e-file your return. And that means the responsibility is on you now. Make a photocopy of that tax return we gave you, that hard copy, and send it to the IRS and send a copy to the uh, state of California because we will not e-file your return. And that does happen from time to time. Here's the 1040. If, if you go on, on the IRS website, your 1040 for 2020 looks a little bit different. It's been updated. It includes a, a couple of things to include uh, charitable contributions and above the line deduction, which we're going to talk about in a second. But uh, that's, uh, that's on the 2020 return. But you can, you can see here, if you see the income that's reported, both the W-2 wages and the interest income, and then that uh, adjustment which was the, uh, the, uh, the penalty because he cashed in his uh, CD. You can see the standard deduction is taken here by the taxpayer. The standard deduction amount has gone up. You don't have to memorize that. The software is gonna handle that automatically. And then we got taxable income. And then I got a question, a softball question. Softball question for, how about Audi? Audi, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Audie, where would you go to find a tax table or a tax schedule? To find a tax table? Or a tax schedule? Where, where would you go? Uh, I would, well, the 1040 instructions have the tax tables and the tax rate schedules. That's correct. The 1040 instructions, that's probably the, the easy breezy way because sometimes taxpayers say, well, How'd you get that? I would tell them, well, the computer calculated it. Well, but how, how did the computer get that? So I'd open up the instructions and I would show the uh, taxpayer, here's the table, this is you, this is your taxable income, that's the, uh, that's the tax. And they say- and, oh. and also that summary sheet that, that you had, it gives a tax rate, what, what yes. the effective tax rate is. Yes, yes it does. Good point, good point. Okay, so that's tax. And then of course we have withholding. And the difference between your tax and your withholding is the amount, in this case, that he, uh, that he is overpaid, he's going to get the refund. And then down here, the vast majority of our VITA taxpayers provide their uh, bank information and uh, the routing number, account number, so they can have direct deposit. Direct deposit usually takes about five business days. Um, 
And some people want a snail mail. They want a hard copy check. I tell them, well, if you want to, you can do that, but it's going to take many, many weeks. And it's not, uh, it's not foolproof. You know, your, your, your check can be taken out of your mailbox sometimes. So most people want that direct deposit. Mm -hmm. I've had some people tell me, Jerry, I don't want the government to have my, my uh, bank account information. I tell them the government already has your bank account information. But anyway, it's up to the taxpayer. Okay. And here, this of course will be slightly uh, modified for 2020, but this is a schedule one. And on the schedule one, you can see down here on line 17, the penalty on early withdrawal of savings. Your additional income items are up here and your adjustments are in part two. Okay, so this is pretty basic return. Uh, this particular document is gonna be generated. If you want, you can take it out of the package because uh, this doesn't apply for this taxpayer, but the software automatically generates. You can see the carry forward of the state income tax withheld and the California State Disability Insurance, which totaled $2,300. Now, what I do for both my VITA customers and my uh, clients in my practice, I remove the Schedule A if they have a standard deduction. I don't want to confuse them. Your Schedule B is interest and dividend. In this case, this individual had interest, and there's no dividend income. Occasionally, uh, down here, you might have a taxpayer who has a account in a foreign country. If that's the case, you can populate that in, uh, in the software. Here's your California return. And a lot of times people get confused. They think California is the same as the federal government. They think the tax rates are the same and the deductions are the same. And I tell people, California has the revenue and taxation code. The federal government has the internal revenue code. So it's two different sets of laws and that's why it's a completely different return. In this case, there is an exemption on the California return for $122. That's a non-refundable credit. You can see right here on page two, the state wages are the same as the federal wages. And uh, we go all the way down to line 18 where it says itemized deduction, standard deduction. In this particular case, this taxpayer has the standard deduction of 4537. Your California itemized deductions are different than your federal deductions. So it's gonna be a different amount. And then you see the tax table and uh, let's see, let me get another participant here. How about, um, hey, John, are you, on the, uh, are you on the call? Yes, I am. All right. John, where would someone go to find a California tax table or California tax rate schedule? I'm not sure, but I would guess it would be in the instructions, just like the federal. Correct. The instructions Springs. to the 540. Correct. Yeah. That's where you'd find it. But of course, it's built into the software. So there's the tax amount. You can see the exemptions. So the difference now is 1443. That carries all the way down to the bottom of the page. And then you can see right here, that's the total tax. And uh, sometimes I'll ask people, hey, what, what's your tax? What's your California taxes here? And let's say, well, I got a refund of $4. I'm thinking, no, you got to go to line 54. That's your total tax. That's the tax liability. That's what they're going to pay. In this case, they happen to have some withholding. So the difference, of course, would be that refund. And that refund is reported down here and also on the uh, last page. This is the page. Uh, if you have a taxpayer, uh, these are, uh, I think that all of these are really, really good causes. And so if a taxpayer wants to make a contribution they can make a contribution. Of course, their refund will be smaller, but you can see there's just a number of organizations that are reflected here on page four of the California return uh, where you can make that uh, donation. Again, a lot of good causes. And then last page of the California return. In this case, this individual has a refund. Same thing, most people want a, a direct deposit, so they'll provide that bank information. And again, usually about five, uh, usually about five days to get that money. So, oh, any, any questions about the form 1040 or the form 540? Okay, then we just have a couple more minutes. So what, I, what I'd like to do, I'd like to go ahead and uh, load up the rest of my PowerPoint, just run through a couple things here, point out a few things. Okay. So we, uh, 
We talked a little bit about filing basics, but again, you can find who must file in your pub 4012. And it's based on your filing status, your age and your gross income. I would encourage you, if you haven't read the definition of gross income, get into page alpha one of uh, your 4012 and it'll describe your gross income. And then other people have to file, your self-employed people, if you're in covered California, if you got that 10% withdrawal, that those are some examples of when you, when you have to file. When people come to the VITA site, usually they're there to get a refund. And so that means they should file to get that refund, whether it's uh, the earned income tax credit or the amount that they've had withheld from their check. And if someone doesn't have a final requirement, uh, I tell them, hey, you don't have a final requirement. And sometimes they say, okay, and they get up and leave. Or sometimes they say, well, I want to file a return. Um, it's up to the site coordinator. Anybody who comes to me and says, Jerry, I want to file a return, I'm going to file a return for them. Uh, past due returns, sometimes you see that. Uh, there's a general rule, then there's exceptions. The general rule is you get three years to file your return uh, to get that refund. That's the general rule. Uh, amended returns, some sites do them. Fred, I don't know if your site does them, but uh, if you do amended returns, you now can file electronically. And uh, that's when the, typically the taxpayer wants to uh, amend their return, change the return to get a refund. That's typically why people amend a return. And then your filing status, we'll talk a little bit more about this um, uh, in the next sessions, but uh, you should keep in mind, use that decision tree. And typically the issues that you're going to bump into is your head of household filers. And they have to meet certain requirements. And you should remember in that uh, publication 4012, head of household means they are unmarried or considered unmarried for tax purposes. And, but again, we'll talk more about that. And I don't know about AERP, but in VITA, where there's no such thing as in California, we don't do married filing separate returns. So stay away from that. If someone says, I want to file a separate return, you should tell them, okay, but we cannot assist you here. We're not trained to do that. So we don't do that. Okay, a couple other things. Uh, we showed you that tab, that ACA tab and tax layer. We're going to go through an example. We have a 1095A, but you should keep in mind if someone comes to the VITA site with that health insurance marketplace statement, that means they have to conduct a reconciliation. They have to file a tax return. It's required. And that means they're in covered California. And if they're in covered California, that means they are receiving a taxpayer subsidy, which means number one, they've got to file the return. And number two, they may have to pay back some of that subsidy because they received too much, or they may get an additional amount because the subsidy was too little. And that's calculated automatically when you enter data into the software from the form 1095A as an alpha. And again, we'll go through an example. I think it's week three on that. California residents, um, this is the new law. You have to have health insurance or you, you can get an exemption. And those exemptions were similar to the old federal exemption, the laundry list. But again, that's all, uh, all gonna be listed and we're gonna discuss that when we do the uh, California return. And if you don't um, have an exemption and you don't have insurance, then you have to pay a penalty. And I don't know if you can see it. Let's see it. Audie, I've got to get you out of the way. I see your, your screen is there. Okay, she's gone. There we go. So you can see an example. I looked this up on the uh, Franchise Tax Board website. Married filing joint couple with $60,000 of, uh, of income who don't have an insurance and don't have an exemption. Their penalty to the state of California is 1,500 bucks. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money for a penalty. So again, this is an important thing for you know, informing taxpayers, hey, if you're in California and you're a resident, you probably wanna get insurance so you can stay away from that penalty. And this is the Franchise Tax Board form that will generate that penalty if it's warranted, the form, the FTB form 3853. Okay, a couple other things because we are running short of time. Again, we'll revisit this so we reinforce this knowledge. We know independence, there's no dollar amount associated with it, but we know credits are associated with it. And so when you're talking about dependence, page Charlie one in your publication 4012, you want to go through that. You want to determine if they're a qualifying child. And if they don't meet all of the tests, then you go to the qualifying relative. And what I do when I'm talking to a taxpayer that has kids, I will go through that lock step because I want to make sure I ask them the questions 
and I want to make sure they're either entitled to a dependent or not. Uh, this stuff, if you're a returning volunteer, you've seen all this stuff. I'll just mention a couple things. I've had probably a thousand taxpayers over my uh, over my tax experiences. Uh, hey, do I, I do I have to report this income? I'm thinking, well, yeah, based on what you told me. Well, I don't have uh, an information return. I tell them, well, you know something, but you receive the income. And I always go back to this, because you know I used to work with the IRS. I always go back to this code section. I said, look, it says right there, unless or except is otherwise provided, which means if there's an exception, you got to report your gross income, plain and simple. And so I've had people say, well, Jerry, um, I got cash or you know, I didn't get a W-2, I'm thinking, you know something, we're gonna find a way to report your income because you had income and you had a filing requirement. But typically they're gonna have an information return and these information returns, this is for a wage earner, the W-2, interest income, the INT, dividend, that would be through a, a corporation or a mutual fund, a B would be your brokerage statement. And we're gonna talk about that in detail, capital gains and losses, uh, government payments, this is the 1099, whoops, 1099G. Uh, new this year is um, payments of $600 more for non-employee compensation can be broken out from the 1099 MISC to the 1099 NEC. So that's new this year. Your 1099R, that's pretty popular and vital. People take uh, distributions from a qualified plan. And then we see a lot of uh, seniors who receive uh, social security and they come in with the 1099. Uh, the SSA 1099. So we'll go through these, we'll enter that into our practice returns in later sessions. A couple other things before we go. Uh, in the VITA program, we see a lot of uh, ITINs, typically, not all the time, but typically it's undocumented taxpayers. What that means is, is they're living and working in the United States, and let's say they're from uh, originally from Guatemala or from Mexico or from uh, Nicaragua, something like that. Typically what happens is they're going to meet what is called a substantial presence test. And all that means is they're living in the U.S. a certain amount of time per your screen. You look back those three years and if they meet the substantial presence test, they're deemed to be a resident alien for tax purposes, which means they file a form 1040 just like me. Um, and that's the way it works. Uh, usually a lot of people who come to the VITA site, they know that they, they, they meet the substantial presence test because they've been here for five or 10 years and they're working. If they don't have an I-10, they want to fill out an IRS form W-7. And the last time, and Annette, if you're still on the line, you, maybe you can chime in. I don't think you can get an I-10 in five minutes. I think you can probably get it maybe a couple, couple, two or three or four weeks. Is that right, Annette? That's correct. It takes time. Okay. Yeah, I've had some people, hey, press that button, Jerry, and get me an I-10. I'm thinking, you know, the IRS is pretty sophisticated, but they're not that sophisticated. <laughs> so, um, you're going to have to wait. But anyway, you got to get one of those. And then your IPPIN, we're going to go through this also. People have their identity stolen, so what they do, they can do it now. They go right to the IRS website, and they can uh, fill out some stuff, and they'll get that uh, letter sent to them. That's an IRS notice, CP01 uh, alpha. And they can get that uh, particular six digit number. And with that six digit number, they can file electronically. electronically. Okay, what else? Um, this right here, I've seen this a few times. Uh, I, I put this up here, just kind of remind you, because a lot of times people say, well, yeah, I got the check in 2020, but I didn't go to the bank until early 2021. And I say, oh, that's easy. Uh, you're what is called a cash basis taxpayer. You had receipt or constructive receipt of income in this uh, tax year. You're going to report it in this tax year. I see that a lot with self-employed individuals. And so I explain the concept of, uh, of constructive receipt or actual receipt of income in a particular tax year. And they say, okay, got it. And then we're going to report it in 2020, even though they cashed the check in uh, 2021. And then I've seen this for some strange reason. I see the assignment of income doctrine a lot. We have mothers come in, dads come in with Social Security SSA 1099s for their kids. And they go, yeah, put everything on my return. We say, well, no, the general rule is you cannot assign income to someone else. If you've earned the income, you've received the income, you're going to report it on your return. There are certain exceptions, but again, the, the example I gave you, Social Security, the kids, if they have a filing requirement, it's going to be on their return. 
uh, you don't add up all the Social Security and, and dump it on mom's return. I've seen that a number of times for some strange reason. Let's see, I think that's it. Now we already went through that example. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop talking. And if anybody has any questions, we've got about five minutes. I'll open it up for questions. Jerry, is the uh, PowerPoint, is that going to be made available to us? Uh, yeah, yes, Paul. Um, I'm going to I'm going to beg. I'm going to plead. I'm going to even pay if I have to uh, Steve or IT guy to get this out. Can you do that, Steve? Yes, sir. Um, I will have um, since Fred is our coordin uh, site coordinator at Sinclair, I'm going to coordinate with him to have this posted or email, um, whatever it may be. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, Jerry, there was, uh, I know you probably are going to uh, talk about this um, in a later discussion. Um, there was uh, an item there um, about uh, $300 charitable um, contribution. Um, and is that the max or something like that? But uh, that's Bernard is asking that question on the, on the side here. But yeah, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out right yeah. now. So on the 2020 return, if you go to line 10 B is in Bravo, what you can do, let's say you don't itemize, and what you can do, you can take a charitable contribution up to $300 if you're donating cash to a uh, qualified charitable organization. And that's really important. When we talk about the Schedule A, we're going to talk about qualified charitable organizations. There's a lot of organizations out there, but it has to be qualified, which means they file paperwork with the IRS. They're going to fill out an IRS form 990. They're considered a nonprofit, if you will. And that's under the, the rules of 501c3. There's 501c4, 5, 6, and 7. But basically, they're a nonprofit. But yeah, that's, that's a good thing. That's, again, $300. And what it is is an above-the-line deduction, which essentially reduces their taxable income. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I'm on, I'm on the uh, I'm on the the non-paid clock until noon. All right. Anybody else who wants to um, anything? Any thoughts before we um, we end up um, um, anything? Uh, I would like to um, Jerry, if you don't mind, if there's no question, maybe maybe a thirty second um, overview of what's gonna be like for next. Uh, week's discussion or training. That way, at least for some of us, uh, like me, I probably gonna read up a little bit more in advance to, you know, to understand it fully. Sure. Uh, the focus for next week will be Schedule A, which is the itemized deductions, Schedule C, the sole proprietor, and Schedule D, capital gains and losses. And then what we'll do is I'll have scenarios that I'll go through, and then I'll have scenarios that I'll essentially assign, and then the students will have an opportunity to to work it and then we'll come back and we'll discuss it but th that's going to be the focus a c and d schedules a c and d okay thank you anyone else all right so uh, if there's nobody else i uh, wanted to chime in in here i would just like to um uh, thank everybody for attending this um uh, virtual event and uh, surprisingly um it really went well according to what I observed here. And again, we appreciate Jerry for doing this uh, training for us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, for everybody who's attending, thank you for your time. And uh, really, we're looking forward uh, to uh, be um, uh, working with you and preparing taxes. And uh, we really appreciate your time and dedication to this great program uh, to help other people, uh, especially the low-income people. Um, so if you don't have anything, um, again, it's the same time next week. Um, just a reminder, I will open it up um, 15 minutes before the start time of nine o'clock. If you do have any question or anything like that, that, uh, you know, try to, um, or I, I may open it up 30 minutes prior. That way you can validate your, your sound, your, your speaker, your whatever you may have. Uh, just to make sure that you will not encounter any issue during that time of the session, because we one thing we want to to um, uh, to do is you know stop the session and um, affect a lot of people that are already uh, trying to listen listen in and stuff like that. So just be understanding for that. Um, 
And um, again, uh, hope everybody is safe and uh, thank you so much. And uh, again, the recording is gonna be available, but we'll email it later as well as the PowerPoint. Okay, and so- Steve, yes. Thank you guys. Do you have a phone number, please? Phone number for who, me? For you, yeah, if I could. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put it down with Fred's. Um, thank um, you. Yeah, so, um, so thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll send it to you privately, all right? Thank, thank you, you guys for doing this. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you guys. Have a good day and be safe. All right. So, thank you. Hey, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. All right, Jerry. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.